shouldn't lose hope yeah. in the idea that um, we know that things change rapidly. We don't need to lose hope in that. And even if someone does feel that there's not much, I can't see any way out, there's ayat in the Quran that speaks specifically about this situation. And the whole of the, the Meccan period, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this, mm -hmm. is this great trial, tribulation, you can't see any way out. How on earth am I going to do anything? I've got 80 followers, mm -hmm. right? I'm supposed to come as a messenger for the whole world, right? And my own qawm, I can barely get them. So then the Messenger of Allah is worried about this and the Quran consoles the Messenger of Allah constantly, 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 and there's eventual success. So those who have these, uh, you know, they present themselves as being powerful and untouchable, invincible, they're going to die inevitably. They're going to have to stand before Allah inevitably. And all the greatness they saw for the 60, 70 years that you did, you have an eternity of punishment and pain you have to experience. There's very few people that I've seen uh, in, uh, you know, that have that meticulousness in their scholarship, um, especially in the English language. Very few that I've seen uh, the, to the level of uh, Professor Finkelstein. You still see uh, the resurgence of these ideas constantly. Yeah. Right. So when you see, if you were to go on and go to any uh, pro-Israeli um, you know, website, uh, video, Twitter handle, whatever, right? You see the same stuff regurgitated uh, about the history. So they said, this is what happened, right? So they'll give you a history. And once you do that, um, it does uh, start to make the, uh, it skews the way we view what happened. For someone to come out to talk about things that actually have material consequences. And that's why it's very justified to say you have blood in your hands. Mm -hmm. It's no longer misgendering a, uh, you know, a feminine man anymore, right? It's no longer saying, uh, you know, I'm fighting for the right to say he and all sorts. This is not about that anymore. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today is the 18th of October, 2023. And we are recording today uh, one day after the massacre that occurred at Al Ma'maduni Hospital, otherwise known as Al Ahli Hospital in Gaza, where there is a war taking place, a genocide uh, against the Palestinian population by the Israeli occupation. And this started from the 7th of October, Saturday. Now, this episode is going to be a little different to previous episodes where we have discussed more theoretical concepts, uh, more you know to do with the, th the theological parts of Islam and stuff like that. Today we're talking about a current uh, event that is happening, history in the making, and we're going to be discussing some of the things that we have observed uh, about this war, about this genocide. And the lessons we can learn from the literature that has been written on previous conflicts that have happened in the past. Uh, but before that, and uh, we know that there is a lot of material out there, and we will put material in the link in the link description box below that people can access to uh, read up on and educate themselves about the history of Palestine and the history of Israel and the various conflicts that have happened in between. But very briefly, just before we begin our episode, and uh, we begin discussing these books with our uh, esteemed teacher, Maulana Zishan, I just wanted to run through some brief uh, turning points, some brief points that we need to keep in mind when we talk about Israel and Palestine. So, we need, it's important that we understand this so it gives us a bit of context. If we don't know anything about this uh, issue coming into this podcast, then hopefully this will give us a bit of background. The Jewish population that was living in Europe, uh, they sought out a homeland. And this was done at the end of World War I, when the Ottoman Empire still had some control over the Middle East. Um, and the homeland that they sought was in Palestine. This became possible when the British took over the land from the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War. And when Lord Balfour signed his declaration, which is known as the Balfour Declaration, giving right to Jewish people to live in Palestine and to migrate there and to set up their uh, estate there. This uh, ushered in an age of migration for the Jewish people to move into Palestine. And from there, a lot of tension 
a lot of conflict arose between the existing Palestinian population, which is a key point, an existing popul- uh, population of Palestinians, and the Jewish settlers, the Jewish uh, people who are coming in. This continued until World War II, and in fact after World War II, until 1948, when the British formally relinquished their mandate over the region, and Israel as a state was announced and established. And this is known to the Palestinians as the Nakba, the catastrophe. When this occurred, there was conflict and war from the outset. The Arab states in the region, namely Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, they formed a coalition alongside the Palestinian population, and they engaged in the first war with the newly established Israeli state. Uh, Unfortunately, that resulted in an Israeli victory. And it resulted in territorial gains for Israel. For, uh, for Israel Israel is the Arabic firm form of that. They took over much more land than they were originally given uh, by the British. That also led to another war with the same Arab states getting involved again. And again, the Israeli state took more land. In fact, uh, it was in this war that they ended up taking the Gaza Strip uh, away from Egypt. And they also took the West Bank from Jordan. And from then on, there have been many more conflicts and wars like the Yom Kippur War. um, And a a much more aggressive policy of Israeli colonization, where they encourage and they move people into the territories of the Palestinians uh, to form settler colonies. And this has been happening for a number of years. And it's one of their policies that they have really encouraged amongst their own people. Um, That culminated in a revolt, which is known as, or two revolts, which is known as the first and the second Intifada, um, which are huge turning points in recent, more recent history. And has not, it, it it was so damaging that nothing since has happened of the like until now where we had what we saw on the 7th of October. Um, And here I want to bring in our teacher, Maulana Zishan. The issue of uh, Gaza and what you see there, um, I just want to know your initial thoughts and what do you feel when you see what you see on the TV and or if you don't own one, then the news. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So this is a uh, it's a bit of a difficult one to discuss because um, number one this is not the usual topics that we kind of discuss especially when it's current um, uh, political commentary because it's ongoing and if you remember from last episode I did mention that I'm not someone who's active on Twitter so for this purpose I was trying to navigate through um, Twitter and see what the news comes in and it is um, it's quite shocking and just to kind of start this off before we even go into the details of it that uh, because we are going to go into the details of it and um, try to provide a some form of insight into what's going on hopefully some stuff which a lot of people may not be aware of and provide some sort of guidelines of what to read and study on for further information so uh, just to come back to this we want to start, I think, anyways, that there is a great feeling of helplessness. And it's something that I think every Muslim that's been following what's going on uh, does experience this. And uh, because you see such great um, uh, destruction, you see such great uh, you know, loss of life, pain, like just great, you know, many things go across your mind that when you think of death tolls, but then that death tolls are people who are part of families. So it's not just the people that died, it's the families that experienced that. It's a whole host of uh, and then it's consistent. So it's not something that we are, um, it's just happened for the first time. We've been experiencing, we're seeing this every few years, an escalation takes place, and then we see who, for, who uh, bears the brunt of it. And we'll talk about how the escalation takes place, inshallah, but no problem. But that's something that I think we do experience. Uh, so we, this form of helplessness. But um, if someone reads the seerah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you read the Quran, you will see many incident, uh, uh, examples of the Messenger of Allah and the, uh, the messengers before him. Because this is one of the reasons why the Quranic stories are mentioned to the Messenger of Allah is because 
to tell him that there were anbiya before you that went through similar struggles and sometimes you know great struggles and you come to sometimes uh, points where you think ah, this isn't there's nothing else beyond this you, you and this is the worst it can get and then allah ta'ala can trial you more but this is what allah tells us tilka ayyamu dawiluha that these are days that we pass between people so you have your high and if you look at for example um the state of israel right now these same um these same people 100 years ago were experiencing the holocaust so those people who were experiencing that at that time they thought there's no way that we're going to experience or our people are going to experience any um power a hundred years goes by and now there's this superpower that everyone is afraid of but then another hundred years will come and who knows what will happen and we can see something is that the world radically does change um in moments so there's many times people say i can't see that happening right but allah ta'ala does such but there's one hadith I want to mention and I pulled it up because this is a hadith that kind of gives me a bit of um and you know we say me it sounds quite selfish like you know we've not gone through anything we're just reading stuff that's one thing right? I, I noticed that when we discuss this we always mention our feelings but then it's yeah. like it sounds very selfish to even discuss yeah. your feelings so, exactly so when we talk when I'm saying well I felt sad I felt upset yeah. reading Twitter uh you know I'm not going to read this anymore I can't watch this video it's all about me me how I experience it yeah. And that concept itself sounds so shameful that um, we're just struggling to read the content, etc. But just the notion of um, this helplessness that we feel. Um, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, and I pulled it up here because I, I think it was it's quite a powerful hadith where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, he says, "Yu'ta bi an'ami ahli dunya min ahli nar yawm al qiyamah." That a person who had the most amount of blessings in this world, right? So he says, "Bi an'ami ahli dunya." Uh, but they were from the disbelievers, the kuffar, right? So they'll be brought on the day of judgment. So they'll be dipped into the hellfire. And so then it will be said, يَا بْنَ آدَمْ هَلْ رَأَيْتَ خَيْرًا قَطُّ That did you ever experience any good? So all of this, you know, 70, 80 years of um, you know, luxury that you experienced, this power that you experienced, uh, you know, fighting for these small little things that you think are so important to you, that... He'll be asked, Hal ra'ayta khayran qattu? After being dipped in the hellfire, did you experience any good? Hal marra bika na'imun qattu? Did any blessing ever pass you? Fayaqulu, so he will say, La wallahi ya rab, know by Allah, my Lord, that I never experienced anything. And then the opposite side, we find that he says, Wa yu'ta bi ashaddin nasi bu'san fi dunya min ahli jannah. That the person who's gone through the most extreme form of hardship will be brought. This is talking about ashaddin nas. So people that are struggling, suffering, etc. That's there, but we're saying the ashadun nas we're talking about. Someone Allah never experienced there. any, any good. of happiness. Any right. Good. So we hope that even some people that are going through difficulties now, there'll be some moments of happiness. Mm -hmm. But imagine the person that is the hasn't experienced any happiness. Mm -hmm. Right. So you say ashadun nasi bu'tsan fi dunya min ahli jannah. But the people of paradise, they're believers. So they will be brought forward. For yusbaghu sabagatan fil jannah and they'll be dipped into jannah. Wa yuqalu lahu and said to them, Ya bna Adam, hal ra'ayta bu'san qattu? Did you experience ever any difficulty, any sadness? Hal marra bika shiddatun qattu? Did any difficulty ever pass you? For yuqulu say, La wallahi ya rab, ma marra bi bu'san qattu? Wa la ra'aytu shiddatun qattu? That I never experienced any hardship, any difficulty in my life. So when we put that in perspective, that we know that there's always going to be an ultimate form of justice. It does kind of give you one, uh, one um, even if we don't experience that in our life, all right? Because that's one of the things that we say, we want to see the success, we want to see the victory, and that's fine. But even if we don't see it in our lifetime, we know there's ultimate justice in the end. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of gives you something. So when you see people so powerful, smiling, smirking, and a clear lying and distortion, mm -hmm. and you're left as a sense of helplessness, you're like, well, I can't do anything about it, right? Like even what we're doing here, mm -hmm. right? This is, not, this is uh, you know... Um, for anything, I think it's more for myself. It just it makes us feel like we've done something. Whether people listen or not, that's up to them. But it just kind of makes me feel a bit more comfortable with thinking, you know what? At least I tried something. I was reading, um, so some of my, one of my friends has translated uh, Mustafa Sabri's uh, book, Qawli Fil Mar'a, which is a book about women and feminism, etc. So in the introduction, he talks about the biography. This is Mona Muzammil Hussein and his, I forget the other brother's name. And so in the introduction, they mention a quotation of Mustafa Sabri. Because Mustafa Sabri was writing uh, to Ataturk after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And so when he writes it, he goes, I am not under any delusion that they're going to listen to me. All right? I'm not under any delusion they're going to listen to me. But this is for me my form of iqamatul hujjah. I'm establishing my evidence. 
So then when I am raised on the day of judgment, I can say, yeah, Allah, I did say something, right? I couldn't do anything, you know, we could probably do much more, right? But I'm saying at least I have something to offer saying, you know, I couldn't do much. There was this little thing I did say, and hopefully that could, you know, um, give us some sort of uh, leg to, to stand on to say, at least we did something. So he was saying that this is not, I don't, I don't think they're going to listen, right? I don't think there's going to be some mass change, but at least I can say that I did say something. Whatever I was, was in my capacity, I did. Even then, I don't think we're doing in our capacity, but yeah. we did something. That's a better way to say it. I don't think um, I'm arrogant enough to say such a thing. But anyway, but that was just a couple of thoughts about. So we shouldn't lose hope yeah. in the idea that um, we know that things change rapidly. We don't need to lose hope in that. And even if someone does feel that there's not much, I can't see any way out, there's ayat in the Quran that speaks specifically about this situation. And the whole of the, the Makkan period, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this, mm -hmm. is this great trial, tribulation, you can't see any way out. How on earth am I going to do anything? I've got 80 followers, mm. right? I'm supposed to come as a messenger for the whole world, right? And my own qawm, I can barely get them. So then the Messenger of Allah is worried about this and the Quran consoles the Messenger of Allah constantly, 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 and there's eventual success. So that eventual success will come, whether we see it or not is, uh, is another question, mm -hmm. but the eventual success will be here. But even if we don't, we can look forward to this day that we can look and say, at least ultimate justice will take place. So those who have these, uh, you know, they present themselves as being powerful and untouchable, invincible, they're going to die in inevitably. They're going to have to stand before Allah inevitably. And all the greatness they saw for the 60, 70 years that you did, you have an eternity of punishment and pain you have to experience. So that we should give every believer some form of um, content to know that whatever's happening is ultimate justice, inshallah. I think as well, just to um, add to this, there's another point here as well that the the people who are experiencing this kind of uh, the people who are experiencing this kind of uh, injustice and this 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 mass genocide essentially, they themselves um, are in high spirits and their mm -hmm. iman. The you know you watch videos and you hear clips and all that they they're saying what's on their tongues is Hasbunallah wa al wakil Hasbunallah wa al wakil. They are hopeful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that their suffering will be removed from them and they will be given victory. Mm. And that's the belief that they have. And you see, uh, I remember there was a video that I was watching. One of the guys, is he asked him, how are you doing or how are you? And the backdrop is just utter destruction. And he says, alhamdulillah. And he's smiling. Mm. He says, everything's destroyed, but alhamdulillah. You know, uh, everything is for Allah. And, you know, we 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 carry on as we are. Hasbunallah mm -hmm. and Wakil. And uh, you know, that kind of bravery, that kind of um morale mm -hmm. should also uplift us that when we feel when we are sitting here feeling helpless to help the uh, people of Gaza, they have put their reliance in Allah subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala. And the idea of ibtila, which is being trialed and tested, we don't only get trialed and tested through difficulties, we get trialed and tested through blessings. Yes. Yeah. So the idea that we look and say, how are they being trialed? And, you know, we've got it easy. No, these ni'am, right? Everything will be asked for. So uh, in the right now, of course, we don't ask for test. Mm -hmm. in the hadith, we don't ask for ibtila. We don't ask Allah Ta'ala come and test. We don't, try, we don't tempt Allah Ta'ala like that. But um, if I'm uh, on the day of judgment and I'm standing before Allah, what position would I rather be in having a small life where I've struggled and I've died as a believer rather than having to question, ask ourselves, answer ourselves for all the blessings that we've got that, you know, uh, just thinking about, you know, we have to um, cut down. One of the things I was talking because I go for runs. I said last, I go for runs. If you think about the concept of that, it means that I have so much food that I can consume. I have to run around to burn that food off, right? That it's not a concept where I'm not an athlete. I'm just, I have to run just to burn my food off uh, because we have too much food. We have to go on diets to control ourselves because of so much of the blessings that we have. Um, you, you know, people watch, I was in last time about shows. There's so much that you don't know what to watch. So you, you're over, like, there's so much to see, so much to do. Um, so this is the, this, we call it a blessing, mm -hmm. right? But it's ibtila, it's our test. Apparently, of course, we got it much more better. But in the end, in the end, when we enter into paradise or hellfire, we're punished, we're rewarded. That's the actual uh, fact for one to consider. So anyway, that's just some initial thoughts. So I think because we are discussing these as believers, we can't forget the metaphysical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about uh, these issues, which we're going to go into from a, uh, you know, either historical, uh, political uh, aspects of social justice, that's all fine. And we'll discuss that. 
But we can't forget the fact that this is something that there is a nirvam, there's a system, and everything runs by that system. Mm. And we can never forget that because for us, it's not just a matter of, uh, that's why people struggle with it. So when people are saying, you know, I had, uh, where, where comments come as we love death the way you love life, they find it difficult to conceptualize. Even believers are the faith to struggle to conceptualize that. Mm. Meaning you're talking about people who believe in God, believe in hereafter, but when they hear a believer say such a statement, it's like, what are they saying? Well, if you also believe in the hereafter of eternity, surely eternity is more significant than limited time that you're here. Mm-hmm. So when someone says, I love death more than life, even as people who are believers of other faiths, it shows you the lack of belief because they're shocked by such a statement, yes. right? Even though they claim to believe in God, right? And that's what our deen gives us. So we have to look at it from a metaphysical angle. So yes, we do accept that there is a form of uh, our worship, our dua, our tahajjud, etc. is very important. It doesn't mean that uh, our solution only lies in just praying, etc. Of course, physical actions have to take place, whatever's in your capacity. But that is an important point. So that shouldn't be put to a side to say, oh, you're going to pray, mm-hmm. right? Why don't you come and do this? You're going to do that? What? This is all part of it because we, we are deen that believe that everything is connected to the qadha and qadr of Allah. Mm-hmm. So Allah is the one who decides everything. So our connection to him is extremely important. So we take every test on an on a individual level and then on a, on a collective level. So we say, what can I do myself? So if that means I'm gonna, I don't pray Fajr, for example, I'm going to wake up a Fajr and make dua, that's your individual ibtila that you're trying to do something for it. Mm-hmm. Right? And that also means that you can do something on a collective level. One doesn't have to be the other. So it's not a choice. They say, oh, you're going to go to the masjid? Why don't you come and do a protest? Or you're going to go to the protest? Why don't you go to the masjid? Mm-hmm. There shouldn't be a choice that puts in front of you. Mm-hmm. Right? You do what's within your capacity, but there's an individual level that we have to look at ourselves at, and then there's a collective level. That's something that our deen teaches us. But uh, we want to start off like that before we go into the details, inshallah. Which is important, which is important. And I guess uh, these things have to be coupled with each other. Yeah. A person cannot uh, hope to achieve any kind of a, a goal or objective in the dunya without paying attention to his akhirah. Because mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately decides both, as you mentioned. Of course. Of course. And um, this is why it's important to discuss these kind of topics as well. Mm. And the book we're going to be using to discuss this topic um, is the book that is titled Gaza. It's just titled yeah. Gaza. Two books we're doing. Yeah. Two books. So the first the one first... we're going to look at is uh, Image and Reality okay. Image of and the Reality. Israel-Palestine Conflict. Image and Reality of the Palestine Conflict. Yeah. And that's also written by... Yeah, so these are yeah. over here. You put the camera. So you, these are some of the books of Professor Norman Finkelstein that um, we're going to speak about. And there's a reason why... Allah knows best if he's going to watch this or not, right? But there's a reason why I've, uh, I've been a fan and I don't, I've been teaching for a number of years. You may have heard me mention him a number of times as well that um, there's very few people that I've seen uh, in, uh, you know, that have that meticulousness in their scholarship, um, especially in the English language. Very few that I've seen uh, the, to the level of uh, Professor Finkelstein. Uh, you give a little bio of him, but before we do that, so these are some of the books that I have of his here. And these books right now, so you've got uh, Old Wine, Broken Bottle, uh, This Time We Went Too Far, uh, Beyond Schutzba, or Schutzba, on the misuse of anti-Semitism and the abuse of history. And this is the book that we were looking at. It's called Gaza, right? It's more of a recent book. And his most recent book is this one, which is I'll Burn the Bridge When I Get to It. This is a different book. This is on wokeism. I actually bought this book to actually do a review of, mm-hmm. um, but I thought I'd branch it so people can know. This is not on Israel-Palestine conflict, but this is his latest book, which he kind of shifted towards the discussion of wokeism. Uh, it's a very interesting work, very thorough as well. So he provides his scholarly, uh, you know, meticulousness to that as well. But these books, and then we've got Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict. So these two books I've chosen, rather than these, there's a lot you can go through, but the reason I've chosen these two is that Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict is uh, to do with um, um, uh, revisionist history or common myths or ideas that um, the pro-Israeli Zionist uh, camp have provided to tell us what actually, what they thought, what they say happened. The propaganda machine. The propaganda machine, out, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the Hasbara, right? This is the propaganda uh, uh, they have. And this is infiltrated into academia as well, mm-hmm. right? So Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict was a book written back in 95, right? So we're talking about a while back. Um, and uh, Professor Norman Tickers, he doesn't talk about this book much anymore. And I'll tell you why as well. Uh, but this, I, th- I think, is an amazing work because many of the same, so even though back in 95, this was written and thoroughly debunked, and we talk about what kind of stuff he debunked, you still see uh, the resurgence of these ideas constantly, yeah. right? So when you see, if you were to go on and go to any uh, pro-Israeli um, you know, website, uh, video, Twitter handle, whatever, right? You see the same stuff regurgitated uh, about the history. So they said, this is what happened. 
right? So they'll give you a history. And once you do that, um, it does uh, start to make the, uh, it skews the way we view what happened. And then the second book that we're looking at is uh, Gaza, uh, an inquest into its martyrdom, which is a more recent book. Uh, and this documents what happened in Gaza, right? What happened in Gaza uh, over the last uh, 17 years. Mm -hmm. So this is in 2018, so of course, the current events are not going to be mentioned. Mm -hmm. But before we move on to that, if you can just provide, uh, read a bit about yeah. the, pro the professor, and then I'll talk a bit about him, inshallah. So Mr. Norman, or Dr. Norman Finkelstein, um, he's a professional political commentator. He's, um, he has his, and this is just very brief, but his, uh, his parents were, um, they, they experienced, they, they, yeah, they experienced the Holocaust and they actually survived the Holocaust. Um, uh, there's that very famous video of him responding to a, uh, a university student or yeah, something, yeah. and he's mentioning in there that you know my parents were in Auschwitz and my whole family on both sides of my parents' uh, families were killed, right? Uh, so he's um, Jewish and he's experienced or he's got a, a, an experience of the Jewish struggle uh, as they had it, um, and. He's had. He's got his PhD in political science, which is probably why he's meticulous in his scholarship, from Binghamton University. Um, and I think the thing that he's most well known for, and the thing that he's most most vocal about, uh, as you mentioned in, in this demonstrated with the books he's written, uh, is his opposite opposition to the Israeli occupation uh, of Palestine and the various human rights violations that they've committed. So he's very frank, more frank than. Um, many public figures are yeah. about how he speaks about them. He even talks about um, the way the Israeli propaganda machine uses things like the Holocaust. Mm. Uh, he has a term for it. It's called crocodile tears. Yeah, yeah. Where he says people have crocodile tears using the Holocaust to justify... He's got a book on this, the Holocaust yeah. industry, which is what he's more popular for. And yeah. I, I do sometimes, I'll interrupt here, but I do sometimes feel like um, we sometimes know a person because of... Okay, it's like the, the video that's yeah. very popular... Um, certain clips that people look at. Uh, Holocaust industry is quite popular. So when I speak about, oh, that book, the guy wrote Holocaust industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do sometimes think that within that, the more um, uh, the scholarship of the man is lost. Mm -hmm. right? The scholarship of the man is lost. So I, I kind of give like a comparison, right? What I mean is that because you can have a PhD, yeah. right? People say oh, you have a PhD in something that doesn't have to mean much. I've That's met true. many PhDs that don't know anything, right? You can you can um, you can scrape your way through anything. Um, so I'll, go, I'll give a comparison of why I think he's such a, a great scholar is that number one, he sticks to his field. So when he does his uh, study on a field, he does his homework. So he spent 40 years studying the Israel-Palestine conflict. When I say studying, I actually mean studying. Mm -hmm. Not 40 years of going through Twitter, that's not Twitter that long ago, right? Not 40 years of watching videos, what we consider research. Sometimes I've done research, what do you do? I watched a couple of videos, saw a bit of tweets, and now I'm ready to talk about it. Right, so these are someone who's actually done their homework, forty years of study, and you can see it in his books. You can see that in his books, the meticulousness of how many sources he uses, how carefully he reads through them. You have to give credit to the guy. And if you look at that person on one side who sticks to his field, you know, does his homework, uh, does all the reading, and then on the other side you have people like Jordan Peterson who are uh, charlatans, I have to say. Right, these people are not serious individuals. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's someone that uh, where how academia goes wrong. That's what I would say. And this is not to do with just what his comments about the, the Israel-Palestine conflict. This is something that, if again, I've not had that much of an online presence, but those who uh, uh, who have taught, except they will know that I've said this many a time, mm -hmm. is that the people like uh, Peterson uh, and those on the same um, wavelength, there's a problem that we have in our uh, in the online scene right now, is the fact that when people start to make money based upon knowledge, so meaning your talent is your information you have, that's a problem because we live in a consumer society. So that means that the amount of knowledge that you have, uh, so let's say, for example, I have um, I have this much knowledge when I put it like that, right? Now, if it's this much of knowledge when I try to materialize that, and now I have to present that to you as my audience, and you as an audience, once you see my video, I can't repeat that again. So I can't keep on regurgitating. People say, oh, this is boring. I've heard this before. So I have to say something new, something new, something new. But once I've done... Uh, my, what we call mablagh or ilm, I've reached the end of my knowledge, what I'm going to carry on because I'm making money through this. This is my, this is how I make an earning. And so people like Peterson have to carry on providing content on things they have no clue about. His field is psychology, right? Yeah. His he's field a, is psychology. psychology. And he's begun, he began speaking initially about religion, 
about the no, idea. No, it was of, about more of it was yeah. He spoke about religion in the past. Yeah. What shot him to fame was fame was the issue of trans. Yes, yes. Right, and this is what I'm talking about. Is that right now because of this fame that he can't handle, mm -hmm. right? He's a, he's an emotional wreck, right? He's a senile old man, emotional wreck. And when he talks about these topics that he has no clue about, right? He talks about topics he has no clue about, mm -hmm. and he make this kind of ridiculous remarks, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the the remark he makes straight after is give him hell. What does that mean? When you, the reason why he doesn't understand, well, I think he does understand, right? But the reason why people don't understand the implication of such as those who are still unsure is the fact that as you see in the studies that we look at is that Israel are relying upon influencers to give them respite. Because once you get someone like him saying, I'm with you, or you get government saying, I'm with you, that allows them to carry on an extra few days. Mm -hmm. And those extra few days mean extra few deaths. So when someone like him says, give him hell, and they can try to contextualize it and do whatever history they want to do after it, but it's too late. You've, you've, the damage is done. Yes. Right? And also the language doesn't suit him. Mm -hmm. The guy is a, he's, he's an emotional wreck. He's usually right? someone who comes across yeah. as mild and, 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 and His biggest jihad, mm -hmm. his biggest jihad is misgendering a feminine man. Right? Mm -hmm. That's not much of a feat. Right? It's a feminine man called you a he or called you a she, whatever they want to call him. Right? I'm such a hero. Right, and now the next step on going uh, to a waging war, you're a feeble old man, all right? Have some shame. Mm -hmm. But the problem that you have is that <laughs> these people rely upon views. That's how he makes his money. So you have to make comments, even if I don't know, right? And this is the, even for example, us ourselves, I can come here and rant and rave, which it seems like I'm doing a bit right now, right? <laughs> but I can rant and rave, but the idea would be that I'm gonna hide behind scholarship because this is a field that is not that I spend my day in light reading about. Unfortunately, right? we are scholar, we are students of the Islamic sciences. So that's where we feel comfortable in. That's what we can talk about. Mm -hmm. That's what I teach about. But when we talk about these, these topics, I can't just do off the cuff. I need to tell you, look, these are the research. These are the books that I've written. Read it yourself. This is what I'm reading. If you have any critiques, here's a scholarship for it. But for someone to come out to talk about things that actually have material consequences, and that's why it's very justified to say you have blood in your hands. Mm -hmm. It's no longer misgendering a uh, you know a feminine man anymore, right? It's no longer saying uh, you know I'm fighting for the right to say he and all sorts. This is not about that anymore, right? This is literally the li life life and death. Situation. Exactly, and the reason why he has to do this, and similar people that like that that are take are making money from delivering knowledge, is the fact that because you have to produce knowledge constantly and your brain doesn't have the capacity to continue to produce stuff, you have to start to delve into topics uh, that you don't know you're not qualified for. Yeah. And that's something which is a broad criticism, but I'm mentioning him specifically because this is caused detrimental, uh, this, the, the, the result is detrimental. Mm -hmm. It's all fine that you know, a person's gone out of his field and you know, he's uh, you know, missed a date or confused a person or doesn't know who this person is and you laugh about it, great. But when your mistakes, because you're ignorant, you remember, I understand this point, right? When we say someone's ignorant, we don't mean that you don't have information, right? If I, to next week, we do a podcast on physics, right? My knowledge of the Islamic science is not gonna help me here. I'm ignorant right now. Even though you can say in your field, you have some knowledge. Mm -hmm. Once you start delving into the field, you're ignorant. Mm -hmm. So when people say, but he's got a PhD, what, a PhD in this? Exactly. Right, and then I'll further say, someone says, what do you have? I'm saying, this is what I'm telling you, I'm reading, I'm bringing you my sources. This is what I've read. You got something better? Show it to me and I'll never read. What are his sources? What is he saying? People like him, mm -hmm. right? And this is what I mean that people like him as Muslims, it's unfortunate that we're like, um, uh, we're like, you know, um, uh, victims of like domestic abuse as a community, that any form of love that we can experience for anyone, we would latch onto them. Mm -hmm. So we've got, a, 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 you know, we've got a man here, not a Muslim talking about, you know, why LGBT is wrong. Oh, we love this guy. He's our Imam now. Mm -hmm. Right, our um, our um, and not only that, but then we'll defend him whenever he errs and gets it 100%, 100%. wrong. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So we have to realize that we are the ones that have the deen. Look, this whole discussion of gender, for example, when we said in the when the Quran says al qawwamuna al nisa, when the Quran talks about gender relations, the idea that man's job to go out, women's job to uh, the general uh, the way that gender uh, the, the way uh, gender is spoken by in the Quran. What Pearson is saying about gender is just reaffirming what we've got to say. So we should say to him that, congratulations, you finally got it. Mm. Right? Congratulations, you finally got what we were telling you. You right? finally caught up. You finally caught up. Now, you can now uh, say this and we will say, well, as long as you're saying that, no problem. You said that wrong, okay, we're not going to read you there. Right? Simple as. But when we become fanboys of people like this, when we become part of them, right, 
and not understand the detriment that people like him have because they're not Muslims. They don't have the same values as us. I mean, they talk, we say openly, we don't have the same values as us. Mm -hmm. These people would be open to, uh, you know, without research justifying such claims of mass violence. Mm -hmm. None of us have said that, mm -hmm. right? So this is why, you know, um, uh, we go off a bit on a tangent, but I just want to do like a comparison of someone like Finkelstein, who, again, not a Muslim, right? But you have someone who is serious about his field. You won't see him, when he does uh, dabble outside his field, he'll say, by the way, this is not my field. I'm just giving you my opinion. This is my field where I can speak about it. And that's why you never hear about him outside escalation. Exactly. The second that uh, the ceasefire eventually takes place and people go quiet, no one cares about it, nor he's does in, it come out. He's in the cupboard. He's back. When it comes to his field, he's there again. Yeah. And this is what I think is commendable, someone like him. And the comparison between the two is an, is a, is an ideal comparison, I think. Mm -hmm. right? Like a, a person who's a charlatan and a person who's a real scholarship person of integrity. And this is not to say that we should now become fanboys and latch on to Norman Filkins. Of course not, of course not. It's but we respect the scholarship. And exactly. the thing is, when it comes to books, this is one of the benefits of when we become a book culture. And this is what the whole podcast is about. You become a book culture because we can actually see what you are saying, what your sources are. We can see how legit you are. You can measure the veracity of your argument. Yeah, 100%. So we say, okay, what, what books have you written on the field? What, what's your critical articles? Let me see them. Let me see your sources and see how well you are, you know, uh, acquainted with the field that you're talking about. And then you can, and books are important. Articles, you can, you know, you can do an opinion piece and say what you like. But with scholarship, you can actually see the detail that the person goes through and what fields they are actually experts in mm -hmm. and when they're not. So, um, but anyway, this is the ideal consumerism of knowledge that we made it as such. It's become supply and demand. So now uh, we do a podcast. We're not getting money from this. We're not, we're not looking to make money from this. So for us, um, if they say, oh, can you do a podcast next week? Oh, I don't have to do it. I will do it when I feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. But if this is my source of income and now next week I have to do a podcast and the week after I do a podcast and I have to do a lecture on this and, and if on I'm that. not prepared, I still have to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what happened. Like, you know, you're not prepared. Right. And uh, then you still have to do it. You're going to say all sorts of crazy stuff mm -hmm. and you're going to carry on. You're going to carry on. And then once you become, uh, you, when you don't care anymore, you say, oh, I rectify it. Mm -hmm. And the hadith says that uh, when you lose any shame, do what you like because you have no shame anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. You have, you don't care about your integrity anymore because you know you can correct yourself tomorrow. But you have a small memory. You'll forget tomorrow. But anyway, we digress. We go quite, uh, you know, into this. Let's, inshallah, get back to the, the books at hand. Okay. So the first book you mentioned was The Image and Reality, hmm. um, written by uh, Dr. Finkelstein. And this uh, focuses on the, as I understood it, the narrative that surrounds these hmm. wars that arise every couple of years yeah. when the Israelis start to uh, massacre Palestinians en masse. Hmm. Um, and he, he focuses on a couple of aspects of these narratives that you mentioned that come up every single time, yeah. these tropes that have come up since the 90s. Um, way before then way before, Even way before, before that as well yeah. Even before that as well And I think we should start with this uh, Concept Which I think Has been the most Proliferate I think The most proliferate trope Out of all of them Which is this concept of um, Human shields You want to go to human shields first? I think we should go with um, History first Okay let's go with history want the image and reality You want to That's go fine. into human shields right? Yeah So if you stick with image and reality Okay um, There's a few there's, So this book uh, the mention, As you mentioned This is tropes that we talk about So these are recent tropes That's why this book is more recent uh -huh. But we'll come to that right? Okay So this book uh, Historical tropes You want to go through um, And this is why again I would say read the book Yeah Buy it These are not extremely expensive books Buy it Read it carefully Right Meticulously Sacrifice two weeks It's not going to you know Stop watching a drama For one or two weeks Right You'll be alright Nothing's going to happen They're still there after two weeks Right. Sit down, read the book. If you care so much about a case, give some time to it. At least give them the respect that I've learned about you. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, like I said, we're shameful for us this, right? But and by the way, we're not going to dodge any questions. You can ask anything that you want about it, right? We'll, we'll try to uh, tackle it as best as we could. Now, uh, this book of uh, Professor Norman Finkelstein, I think he doesn't talk about this topic much anymore. And the reason why he doesn't is for him, he goes, look, the scholarship is settled now. He wrote these critiques, it was rectified, a lot of people came on board. And so in scholarship and academia, you don't get any serious people reiterating some of these claims, right? What are these kind of claims? The claims such as um, that a land without people oh, and a yes. people without land, right? So we are a people as a Jewish nation who need, who don't have a land <clears throat> and we happen to come across a land which is empty. A few little Bedouins here and there, right? And so we co co uh, cultivated the land and so we made it. Right, so these people are just you know peripheral uh, that came after, maybe migrated after. Mm -hmm. These are theories that you have. Uh, similarly, you have the idea of the initial establishment of the Israeli state, and how did all these Arabs, these not all Muslims, but most of the Muslims, how did they, what did they leave for, mm -hmm. right? And so the the theory was 
that they left because they were kicked out. Right? That was the idea. They were kicked out. There were, they were sort of massacres in some instances. They were forced and they were, they were read some of the stuff that happened. But the theory became was no, 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 no. It wasn't because they uh, had to, they were forced out. And this is something which is reiterated. Mm -hmm. Even in a recent video, again, I don't quote videos here, but the fact of the matter is that we have to deal with this is what we're dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. In a recent video by um, uh, Ben Shapiro about five facts regarding uh, Israel and Palestine, which are lies, as he calls it, right? A guy who talks about facts without feelings has so much feelings, right? It's, 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 it's bizarre that a, you know, a, again, it's, a, it's the same thing. The, the, the rhetoric doesn't suit the person. Right, he's a small weasel of a man, and talking about you know killing people, like, it doesn't it doesn't suit you, mm. right? You know, in all this, it's not it doesn't suit your personality to speak like that, right? As if you've gone for war and torn stuff, you're, you know, you're a small little weasel of a man that can put him in a know, war zone, see how he under, yeah. So again, but anyway, so he he reiterates his five lies mm. that people now. One of the lies that he talks about, which we'll talk about here as well, is that no, 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 the Israelis were saying that stay, we will give you everything you need, and he quotes the first Prime Minister Ben-Gurion saying to this effect. Mm -hmm. So this is the lie that they had to um, be exposed. That's not, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So now he mentioned in a few minutes and that's it. So, but the reality is that this has been meticulously documented. Mm. There's, a, there's, there's a great amount of scholarship that has documented exactly what happened. Who did what? Why did people leave? Right? And again, here Finkelstein with primary sources, going back to the original sources, those documentation, those people, eyewitnesses from the Israeli camp, from the non-Israeli camp, uh, saying what happened, right? And he documents this issue, which is called Born of War, not of Desire, explain what that is. And then there's other ch chapters in here where he talks about, the initial starts about Zionism, which is called Zionist orientations, what the idea was. Mm -hmm. So what you end up having is, when you go through, this is just the first three chapters, which are about 88 pages, right? And then the book is about uh, 190, 180, 190 pages approximately. And then you have other chapters that critique other forms of the thing. So we can't go through all of them. I want to briefly touch upon the first three. So the first uh, thing to understand then about the reality of this, again, Everything you want to see is documented. You can go through, buy the book. I would say read it. Uh, it's very, uh, you know, one thing I would say is that um, because of the meticulousness of the works and the scholarship cited, a person who's not used to scholarship may struggle. Mm -hmm. So I would say be patient. Mm -hmm. Be a patient reader, right? Take your time out, read, try to think of it. And so you can have some depth. And even some of the story, even if you don't understand the whole thing, just the, 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 the quotations itself are quite manifest. You don't need to understand the whole arguments around it. So what do you mean by Zionist? Uh, he has this chapter called Zionist Orient, um, uh, Orientations. Mm -hmm. That what exactly was a Zionist project? What were they looking to do? Right? So he has a whole host of, uh, you know, quotations from early Zionists explaining what their theory was. But he has this kind of, I, I really like this um, uh, section on page 13. He talks about, he goes that uh, the relation with the nation state, uh, the nation and state. So in Europe, they constructed the idea of a nation state. And what was a nation state? So he argues because there's two types of nation states you had. You had a political discourse, I'm, quote, I'm reading now, which suggested that the state political superstructure belonged not to the citizens, but to the nation, organic community with a numerical majority. So that's when they have a majority, it's a numerical majority that make up the state. Yep. And the second type, because he calls it a topographic discourse, which suggested that the state territorial unit belonged not to its inhabitants per se, but only to the nation organic community that could establish a single historical spiritual connection with this, uh, with, with it. So you have to have an organic community, which is the actual people of the land mm -hmm. and everyone else is sec secondary to that. So in light of that, of the, of the nation state where uh, the Jews were not feeling uh, comfortable in Europe, they said, well, we like the construct. It's just unfortunate. We're coming out of the end. We're not in the, we're coming, coming on the bad side of this mm -hmm. because we don't get the nation. So the Zionist idea was we take the, we, uh, internalize this concept as being true, but let's apply it elsewhere. So then he carries on, now I'm reading from Finkelstein, he goes, we have already seen that the Zionist, Zionism replicated the reasoning of the anti-Semitic political discourse and followed this logic to conclude that the resolution of the Jewish question required a polity belonging to the Jewish nation. In effect, Zionism also replicated the reasoning of the anti-Semitic topographic discourse in reaching the conclusion that resettling Jewry, which is a Jewish community, in its historical, organic, integral, etc. homeland was the way to resolve the Jewish question. The obvious candidate for such a homeland was, of course, Palestine, land of Israel, with its many, manifold re uh, resonances for the Jewish people. Ideologically, the implications of incorporating Palestine into a discourse that depicted it as the historical homeland of the Jewish people were twofold. In the first place, it rendered the Jewish people alien to every other state and territorial unit. So they recognize we're not part of you mm. in, the, in the Europe. We're not part of you because you recognize that state. Thus, sanctioning the claims of anti-Semitism. So you're, you're, you're justified. We're not meant to be here. 
Second, and more importantly for our purposes here, it rendered Palestine of only incidental importance to his resident Arab population. So you straight away become secondary citizens mm -hmm. because this is our land. This is not meant for you. Yeah, so it's like we have a nation state, so we're British, right? Yeah. So you have when a non-British person comes here, they don't enjoy the same rights as us, yeah. right? We give them rights, but they don't enjoy the same rights as us. So if that's the conception saying, okay, but we're going to base our nation on Jewry, right? Which is on being a Jew. Therefore, those who are Arabs and not Jews, you're going to be secondary citizens from the get-go. Mm. And there's many quotations here that, uh, you know, that um, just, uh, highlights. On, just on this point, right? I, I, don't, I don't want to cut you off in the middle, but yeah. uh, just on this point, because we were going to discuss this as well. Um, this theological uh, justification that is given uh, that um, that the Zionists or the Israeli lobby they use in the US um, and in Christian countries that it's written in it's it's mentioned in the Bible that this is the land of the um, the Jews this is mm. the land this is our land this is where we're supposed to be and. Uh, you know They use that a lot To try and yeah. justify their But the position. argument Makes no sense If you yeah. want to go down The argument of um, j Just from how states Are formed Then you can of course Anyone can claim States to whoever So yeah. why don't you just uh, Have the Red Indians Claim back um, yeah. America And you can go back How far back Do you want to go with that Right mm -hmm. If I find out That actually My ancestors from A place in India And I say Well this is my house Get out mm -hmm. uh, How far back Do you want to go But on a theological place The Quran discusses this mm -hmm. And this is a The Quran And it's such a uh, Again, we don't read it in the context to understand this, but if you look at Surah Baqarah, Surah Ma'idah, Allah Ta'ala talks about Bani Israel, right? And what Allah Ta'ala says to them, He says, Inni ala alamin, that we did choose you, right? And then Allah Ta'ala said, we chose you as a chosen people. And then it lists all the times that they broke the pact that Allah Ta'ala made with them. And the, uh, the, when Allah speaks, it goes, recall, mm -hmm. because they knew of it. It's in the Bible. The taking of the calf is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Right, so you broke my ahad. You broke my ahad. You broke my ahad. Right, so you broke my pact. Then Allah says, "Ofu bi ahdi, ufi bi ahdikum," that you fulfill my pact, I will fulfill you. Uh, you know, I will do for my side. And what was the ahad they broke? And this is why Christians is bizarre that you take this, that those they to accept this is that you broke the pact on accepting the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So what pact do you have? What right do you have to anything when the Messiah came and you rejected him? Mm -hmm. Right, and then when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes, you reject Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. So you have, that was your second opportunity to get the pact back, right? To be part of the Muslim community now. But you didn't. So you don't, you don't have any rights. So the Quran reminds them saying, wait a minute, you're telling Nabi Salsa, my prophet, that you're the chosen people. Have you forgotten your history, mm -hmm. which is mentioned in your text, right? So you're not deserving of anything. So if you want to go down a theological blends, the Quranic argument rationally is more stronger. So if you don't want to believe in theology, say, wait a minute, if this is from God, right? What makes more sense? The God of the Quran is reminding them of their breaking of the pacts constantly that they agree to. And then it says, when the Messiah comes, what do they say? That we said, Qatalna Isa ibn Maryam, Rasulullah. They say this is mockingly. That we killed Isa ibn Maryam, the messenger of Allah. And the Quran condemns that. So not only did they not um, accept the Messiah, they were partaking, then killing the Romans, killed him, but the idea of uh, they hand him over, they hand him over um, that they are part of this. Right, so where do you, where, how are you the chosen people? That's the idea, yeah. right? Where does the chosen person come from? So as a theological perspective, it's not, you know, from a Quranic perspective, it's not true at all. And I think it makes a lot of sense to anyone that reads it. But we can discuss that yeah. um, on the theological basis. But you have to remember, a lot of the people that are pro-Israeli are atheists, yeah, which is quite, a, you know, it's quite a, biz, a sh shocking claim. And I think a lot of them is because one is Asabiyya, mm. this kind of um, fanaticism of your people uh, or what you kind of hold on to. Uh, and there's other, you know, various factors and agendas that a person is behind this. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back to this point, I just want yeah. to quote this one last uh, couple of quotations I want to mention here. Is that um, he for, further says, he goes, as formulated by the Zionist leadership during the period covered by Gorni's study, that's a study that he's looking at here, right? He says, world Jewry's preemptive right to Palestine derived from three interrelated facts. This is what they said, right? Three interrelated facts. This is why they had a right. Number one, the Jewish people's bond with the land of Palestine was sui generic. That a you know inherent right okay. to the land of Palestine. The Arab inhabitants of Palestine, if they did constitute a nation, were not a separate nation, but rather part of a greater Arab nation for which Palestine had no distinctive uh, resonance, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that well, you can just go into Jordan. And people say this. Why don't you just go into? It's like all right, let me go take over Texas, and why don't you just go into another? Uh, you know, or I take over Newham, 
right? Uh, in that's our area, right? Or London, you guys go, there's enough place for you guys to go, right? That's the idea. You're not, uh, you know, this is just part of your wider Arab. So, it, so they had this uh, understanding. You're not inherent to the land is what he's been. Yeah. And number three, the Jewish people had a historical right to Palestine, whereas the indigenous Arab population could lay claim at best to mere residential rights. So that's the perception of these people. Mm. So right now it's in the world of theory, mm. right? It's in the world of theory that this is what we're going to do. So then when you start to understand the mindset, and there's many, you know, further quotations, um, uh, that uh, that reiterates this point. Um, so, for example, right, and if you listen to this, this is um, the one that this is uh, this is what I find hilarious, right? Uh, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad, right? That uh, in uh, Ben Shapiro's video, where he talks about the facts. He qu he quotes a Ben Gurion, who is the first prime minister, right? And this is in the 1930s. He explains his idea. We're going to talk about what he does after, but we look his idea of Zionism, right? So he says, the Jewish state, he quotes in 1930, he says, the Jewish, it's a quotation now, the Jewish state now being offered to us is not the Zionist objective. The offer is not the Zionist objective. Within this area, it is not possible to solve the Jewish question, but it can serve as a decisive stage along the path to greater Zionist implementation. It will consolidate in Palestine, within the shortest prob uh, possible time, the real Jewish force which will lend us, uh, which would lead us to a historical goal. If anything is unsure here, he further clarifies. In a private uh, correspondence, uh, Ben-Gurion amp amplified this point. The Jewish state, he wrote to his son, would have an outstanding army. I have no doubt that our army will be among the world's outstanding. And so I'm certain that we won't be constrained from settling in the rest of the country, whether out of accord and mutual understanding with the Arab neighbors or otherwise. Mm. Right? So this is the idea. So, you know, and this is the, it's just so, there's so many things to kind of talk about here, right? There's a lot to unpack that. Not just this, is the idea. So a lot of the pro um, Israelis, again, we stick to Shapiro, whatever yeah. Peterson, right? They are about our borders, right? We don't like immigration. Mm -hmm. And this is a fact that people that are coming here are not coming to, so when our parents came, they didn't say, we're going to try to make a, another Pakistan here. Mm -hmm. We're going to make, um, quite successful in Bradford maybe, right? But we're, we're going to come here and establish an Indian state, right? There's no goal like that, but you're still upset. So you're changing the culture of our people. Mm. How dare you? You know, and you're upset about it. Criminals are coming in and you need to close the borders, close the borders. By your own logic here, the, uh, the Arabs were more within their right to be scared, not only because they were coming, but they're coming with these ideas. With these ideas of a grand state that would take Imagine that. Point. Imagine there's a, there's a finding that yeah. all of the Asians that have come here from South Asia, it wasn't just for economic reasons. We've come to take over. We're yeah. planning a state. Yeah. Right. People are upset by immigration itself, but now you want to talk about us planning a state, and that's what's being called for by your own logic of your borders. You know that you're so strict about. How can you justify such statements? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the idea. So when you talk about Arab unease, it wasn't because you want to live with you. It's because that's the idea you're bringing forward. You want to take over. And there's many quotations. Right? I'm not going to go through. Yeah. We'll bore you. Like I said, this is something that you should be reading uh, in your own time. So he discusses that. So that's the mindset yeah. that these people are coming with. Yeah. Uh, once they uh, establish, uh, once they get the state. I think there's another facet to this mindset, which is um, this idea of uh, supremacy. This idea where they are, um, we, we touched upon this in the Quranic discourse, yeah. it talks about when they are, they think themselves as the chosen people of God and everyone else, by definition, therefore, is worth a million times less. Mm. Um, you know, the Gentiles are like they, they described even in current the defense minister he described the palestinians as human animals that's their general perception of everyone not just mm -hmm. arabs but any non we're talking about zionists right yeah, but, zionists. But, but even then but you know quran yeah. does talk about uh the them saying that the fire is only going to affect us for a few days yeah all right it's just a few days we'll get away with it right? and these kind of statements the quran very clearly kind of highlights about them this is again this is a, the quranic discourse with uh the jews and even the christian the jews more so is a is a fascinating uh, a, a look at maybe one day we can look into this inshallah but it's a it's a fascinating discourse mm. uh because of course allah ta'ala uh, is Allah Ta'ala, right? So if anyone understands how people work and the way that, because it's not a simple discourse. The Quran, the Quran doesn't talk about kuffar as being just one block of people. Mm -hmm. He understands the various facets and the way people think. And so he approaches each one of the kuffar differently and the various uh, types of them amongst them. It's a very nuanced discourse of the Quran. But uh, that that's 100% true. 
Um, the second uh, section in this book, so I'm going to mention two more, mm -hmm. right? And then we're going to move on to the Gaza thing, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's more in the book anyway. So uh, the second chapter, which is what kind of got this book quite a lot of popularity, was that there was a book called by a woman called Joanne Peters, which is called uh, From Time Immemorial, right? And this book, uh, which was written back in, I want to say the 80s, early 80s, right? It kind of hit the world by storm. Because in this book, um, what do you call it? Uh, Joanne Peters, and the basic argument I'll just read, right? Peters purports to document massive illegal Arab immigration into the Jewish settled areas of Palestine during the British mandate years, 90 to 1945. Her thesis is that a significant portion of the 700,000 Arab residing in the part of Palestine that became Israel in 1949 had only recently settled there. And they had immigrated to Palestine only because of economic opportunities generated by Zionist settlement. Therefore, Peters claims that in the, the industrious Jewish immigration had as much, if not more, right to territory than the Palestinian newcomers. So this kind of uh, turns everything on the head. They're saying, no, no, no. The land was empty while we were migrating, mm -hmm. right? We were, uh, you know, we were coming to the land. And because we were so successful, all of these Arabs started to come here. So when the eventual uh, the Israel st establishes, we were here first. Right. And so, and this has been debunked quite thoroughly, right? But I'll come back to that in a second. So I thought, oh, let me go check this book up, like what's happening on Amazon right now and with the reviews. And again, up to 2022, 2023, the book is still getting five star reviews. People are saying this is a game changer. Wow. This book is amazing. And that's why I think that because Professor Norman says that this is a done and dusted, I think it is done and dusted in academia, these kind of ridiculous claims. But on uh, the ground, when people are reading works and you know, doing this kind of self-study, I don't think it's trickled down completely. If it does, I don't, I don't think it is. I, I don't know what's best, maybe I'm wrong. But I do think that there is a need to still discuss these points. And this book is still very significant. Because when I was reading it, it was still affecting me. Because maybe, because again, like, you know, when you're talking about something for so long, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of, because this was written back in 1995, so you must have started research in the 80s. So you may feel like, okay, I've just discussed it so many times. There's no need to mention it again. That's, there's no need. Everyone's, but there's a new generation of people that come, right? That haven't experienced that. So it's all new for them said, again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I think it's very important to read this text. It's very meticulous the way he goes through the data. So anyway, that's a claim. Mm -hmm. and that for, uh, that the, the land was empty. And as recent as um, a year ago, uh, and that's why it's not mentioned here, of course, it's older than that, right? When uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, comes on the Peterson podcast, he reiterates his point. Mm -hmm. It was a barren land, I believe that's the word he uses. It's a barren land. And so we came and cultivated and people came over, right? This is, the th and this is taken from the works of people like Joanne Peters, right? So then uh, what, uh, what do you call it? Um, how, uh, firstly, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Norman describes it. He goes, that his scholarly work meets with critical acclaim. He mentions all the praise that he got. Uh, acclaim hardly be news. Were it not for the fact that from time immemorial is among the most spectacular frauds ever published in the Arab-Israeli conflict. In a field littered with crass propaganda, forgeries and fakes, this is no mean distinction. But Peter's book has, uh, Peter's book has thoroughly earned it. Right, that's what he calls, it. and then he goes for, and it's, it's uh, you know the, uh, it's Ajib, like the, the 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 stuff she does. I, I don't know if I, know, I can mention examples. I mentioned one just to kind of highlight this what's point. The, right? What's the most like? Ajib? I'll give you one strange, stupid one, right? Yeah. So uh, on page thirty-three, uh, what the professor says it goes. Peters asserts that in eighteen ninety-three, some sixty thousand Jews and ninety-two thousand three hundred non-Jews inhabited the region of Palestine that became Israel after nineteen forty-eight. Uh, that's from page 250, 251, she says that, right? So the Palestine has 60,000 Jews and then 92,300 non-Jews. But then, since 38,000 of the non-Jews were Christians, Jews were perhaps a marginal majority. So if you have 92,300 non-Jews and from amongst them you have 38,000 that are Christians mm -hmm. and the rest are Muslims, the Jews are actually the majority now. Mm -hmm. So therefore, because they're the majority, they should have the land. They're more, they're, they're, they're more right? Uh, and that was done in, uh, in 1893, that is. 1893, that's the census from them, okay? So at that time, there was more Jews than there were Muslims, Muslims and Christians, if you were to put Italian like that. Um, but according to Peter's table in the back of the book, which is on page 445 4, of the book, not 92,300, but 218,000 Arabs resided in, uh, resided in 1893 in the uh, slice of Palestine that became Israel. So in actual fact, there was um, 218,000, not the 92,300 uh, she mentioned. Mm -hmm. How did she get to that conclusion that there was 92,000, even though she mentioned it in the book? Uh, P 
Peter's manages this neat little trick by dividing the region of Palestine that became Israel into three areas and then forgetting in a text the two areas of which became Israel in which there were, she was no Jewish, uh, no Jews, right? But significant Arab settlement. Wow. So what, uh, let's say, for example, I say, well, what's the population of Nuham? So right now in Nuham where we live, there's a large uh, uh, flux of Indian immigrants, right? So I say, well, let me calculate, uh, this is like, let's say there's 30,000 uh, Indians, but I'm gonna only use a region that's relevant to me. So I'm gonna cut off the whole rest. Mm -hmm. And in this region specifically, I'm gonna do, this, do the census. In Nuham, it's in, in East Ham. In East Ham, for example, right? And the others, I'm gonna forget the number. Yeah. Even that became the region. So in actual fact, it was 218,000 versus 60,000. 60, but she cuts off the region she just want, and right. you restrict it to what? 92,000 versus uh, 60,000 makes this cal calculation. And there's many examples of this. And it's boring. Mm. The examples bore you after a while, right? But you can go through it again. And then because of stuff like this, Nathan Yahya, he quotes Nathan Yahya back in this, uh, Benjamin Nathan Yahya at that time, who was the Israel Likud um, leader. He goes, uh, Benjamin Nathan Yahya makes an observation then. Uh, he goes, based on these kind of studies, he says, beginning, this is a quotation now, beginning with the first wave of Zionist immigration in 1880 and continuing through successive waves and after World War I, Palestine was rapidly transformed. And as Jewish immigration increased their numbers, it also caused a rapid increase in Arab population. So they're saying that the immigration were for Arab, they were not indigenous, mm. right? Uh, many of the Arabs immigrate into the land in response to job opportunities and better life afforded by the growing economy the Jews had created. Right mm -hmm. again, this is a forgery. Yeah. Right, and you can read through it, uh, and and you see many examples uh, of such, inshallah. Yeah, and um, this revisionist history. Uh, now uh, we've mentioned this, right? But why is this? How does this play a part today? I mean, I just want to reiterate this point. Now. I want you to reiterate this. Oh, point. Yes, okay. I, how I does this play a part today? I mean, you mentioned it's been debunked, right? And we mentioned that it's not exactly trickled down, and the polit politicians themselves are the ones who are mm. mentioning it. How does this now affect the person's perception of these kind of... You see, I, it's a very concerted effort, mm -hmm. right? And the way it works is that we realize the, how people think. If you can make the water murky enough mm -hmm. and you're in power, that works for you, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's an old, uh, it's, uh, you know, I used to have a, a history teacher in school and she used to say that everything that happens in world politics, you can explain it in what happens in the playground. So the playground politics works the same, just on larger scale. So it's like, um, you know, when you get in trouble in school, right? I say, oh, uh, miss, uh, he called me, uh, you know, an idiot. And you try and say, he said it to me. And the second you say that, you know that the teacher's, what was supposed to do now? Oh, both of you is quiet. Yeah. I do my kids all the time, right? It was both of you for, just go quiet, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a tactic that we use because by the second I do that, it's like, oh, I'm gonna investigate this, right? I can't be bothered with this. Yeah. And that's the average person. Mm. Right, like for example, in Ukraine, Russia, where, where you know we may not have as much, uh, you know, attention to to that. A vested interest. If there's a like a uh, someone says, okay, Ukraine claimed that they were attacked, and Russia said it wasn't us, it was that group. Okay, I'm not too sure, right? And if it's proper and it works, because how many uh, things are we going to be invested in to investigate, right? So the 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 purpose of this is to make the waters murky enough. Now. That doesn't mean there can't be complications, as something can be complicated and simple at the same time. Mm -hmm. right? It can be complicated and simple at the same time. The example of this would be that there's a simple theory here of Zionism that lets immigrate to a land, become the majority, establish a state, kick out the Arabs. That's a simple idea. Now, the way that happens is not going to be that simple. There'll be a hundred, so much nuance in there. There'll be uh, you know, people that sell out, right? Uh, deals will be made, dodgy deals. We're yeah, not trying to claim the that. Hundred percent. We're not saying that the, the, these, uh, you know, all Arabs, all Muslims are innocent. Yeah. Far from it, right? These are human beings. And also, we're not going to say that every, you know, person born uh, in a Zionist family has the same ideas as everyone else. No, we understand there's nuance. And it goes back to the Quranic discourse. The Quran makes a dis dis distinction. For, and if someone's, I uh, say that they're all the same. The Quran makes a distinction, for example, between the Ru'asa, the heads of kuffar, and the main followers. Right? They don't know. Right? The Quran makes a distinction between those who are the tabi', those who are following, matbu', mm. those who are followed. Mm. Those who are followed have a greater responsibility on the head. Mm. But they also, uh, but there's a distinction being made. That's what I'm saying, right? So there's always nuance even in that as well. So the idea that, uh, but the, so the simplicity to it, that no one can deny, but at the same, there's a complication to it, there's nuance to it that not everyone can, uh, that, that, that may require time, effort to appreciate. But what I can do is, if I can murky the water enough to, overdo this, the, 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 so for example, they say, 
um, Israel established a state and then So wait a minute, what, what do you mean established a state? How did where? that happen? On what land, yeah. where, where do they come from? Yeah, And all the Arabs are living there, where do they go? Mm. Right, uh, there's debate Some historians have said this, some, you know like in fiqh when you, or in Islam you say uh, Oh, it's ikhtilaf and that's the used to justify doing exactly. that. Yeah, so it's not an academic point. It's this difference of opinion. Even though one opinion may be worthless, yeah. but there's a difference still. And for the lay person, that's enough for them to murky the water enough to justify a position. So I'm doing something dodgy. You ask me, oh, there's different. All my scholars differ on this. So, ah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Right? It's a tactic that we use and it's effective. Yeah. And these guys have uh, you know, perfected that tactic. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that as time goes on, so the theory of expulsion, which is we spoke about in the beginning, was that once they established a the state now, um, so this is wrong, obviously, right? It's just nonsense, right? So once they establish the state, uh, do you have the uh, two theories of what happens or two uh, histories of what happens? You have the Arab history, mm -hmm. which claims that the Israelis out of fear and some massacres, etc., they kicked out uh, the the Arabs, mm -hmm. right? And that's what caused the refugee problem. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got to Gaza, where <clears throat> seventy percent of the population are from those um, uh, th those who were kicked out. They, they became refugees from there. And then you had the Zionist propaganda, which claimed that these people, uh, they left because Arabs told them to. They said, guys, leave and we'll win. And then you come back in, mm -hmm. right? But they didn't win. So why should we bring them back in again? And if you say that to someone, you say, that makes sense. Not probably the most moral, but I can get behind that. Mm -hmm. That they left out of their own accord. Then their guys lost the war. So why should you bring them back in now? Mm -hmm. Right? But if the other theory is right, then that means that everything that we're discussing, you know, Hamas, it, be, it starts to murky everything. I said, wait a minute. So these people that are living here, they chose seventy percent of here, right? They chose to be here. So why are they fighting for? Yeah. They just lost and they're upset. But if I could tweak it and say, no, 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 they were here because they were forced out. Mm -hmm. So now that they've been forced out here, you start to be more sympathetic to the struggle. Now you say, okay, so it's not seventy years of Gaza struggle. This is a generational struggle. 75 year occupation. And that's where that starts to make sense saying, oh, so these people 70% have been kicked out. So that means their grandparents moved out by force mm. and they come here and then they live in blockade. And now you're surprised that there's a, you know, a, 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 backlash. a backlash that people are going crazy, mm. right? And they become like animals, that's what you claim, right? And you're surprised by that, right? And this is something that I kind of, people don't uh, like, I mean, this kind of fake um, reactions that we have, like we can't understand what, how someone could be so vile, right? The one example I always give is the is the, is the toilet paper debacle of the COVID time, mm -hmm. right? All these sophisticated people in 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 in, uh, in Europe, in, suits. in UK, in suits, etc., right? That understood that we're like, well, we don't we don't like these backwards people, right? There's an alarm that there may be not enough toilet paper. Toilet, it's, it's just such a bizarre thing. Toilet paper, right? And people are fighting, running around, saying, where can I get toilet paper from? Mm -hmm. Right? Because of a small luxury has been taken away from you and you're going crazy. Right? Go cut someone when they're driving. Makes you mad. Turns I was on the way here, someone's, like, someone's driving close back to me. I'm getting angry. Yeah. Right? And you get angry, you, 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 all sorts of things happen, right? But now you're telling a people that have... 70% of have been uh, forced migrate. If this is true, what we're telling you, we're going to show, we show inshallah, right? And then they go through uh, 17 years of blockade. And now you're saying that you're surprised that there is a, firstly, there's a, there's a terrorist organization in there. You're surprised that happens. Let's assume your narrative. Mm -hmm. And you're shocked, right? How stupid do you think we are? Mm. Right? Uh, you know, and people are stupid and it works. Because it must work, people are buying into it. Exactly. Right. So it, it does work. So there's a, there's a, it's effective. Anyway, so let's move on to this notion, right? So um, what happens is that in amongst Israeli uh, academics, because it's happened now. For example, like if you want to look, learn about um, uh, how um, America was conquered, now the best historians of that would, well, are going to be Americans. So it's happened now. Because it's, it's, you're not going to change things now, right? So what happens is uh, eventually Israeli uh, academics, and the one he talks about is Benny Morris. And Benny Morris is the leading academic on uh, Israel-Palestine history, right, in, in Israel. And so he comes out and he goes, you know, this, uh, what they're talking about, uh, it was the Arabs that told him to leave. This ain't true, right? We had a big part of it. 
But what he does is he has uh, Benny Morrissey has a debate of him and Finkelstein online. You, you should watch. Everyone should watch this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Finkelstein rightly accuses him of having many hats. So depending on when he's writing, he kind of shifts his view a bit. But what he did do definitely was he exposed the 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 the, uh, the fallacy or the um, the lie that it was the Arabs that forced him out and there was nothing that was done by mm -hmm. um, by Israel, right? by the Israeli Zionists. So he comes out with a phrase called "born of war, not of design." Mm -hmm. But what he does is he tweaks it. He goes, but I think that this wasn't intentional. It was because of war they kind of moved out. So yes, there were parts of it which was intentional, but it was war that really made them leave. It wasn't the Arabs. So he refutes that, but he tries to take a middle stance. Mm -hmm. But what Finkelstein does in this chapter, which is like he says, it's, uh, it's a gruesome chapter, right? I would advise people to read it, is that he says, but all the facts that you mention show a forced explosion. Mm -hmm. They show that the people in charge were aware of this and they supported this. I.e. the very fact that there was a war caused by an Israel, the Israeli Zionists. Yeah. That's what so, caused but, it to but, move. Yeah, but, but yeah, that, that as well. But very specific points he mentions. Yeah. I will explain some of those points, right? Very specific points. So the idea that this was done out of just by uh, war, not of design, mm -hmm. he goes, your facts go against this. Mm -hmm. So this whole chapter lists the stuff that uh, Benny, Morris is, uh, uh, Benny Morris is saying and saying, the conclusion of this is they were forced out yeah. and there was an explosion and you can demonstrate this quite meticulously. So he goes to us, so I'll tell you, I'll, uh, I'll read some of these things, right? So in the, uh, a few moments ago, I did mention the video of Ben Shapiro, right? Yeah. Where he quotes um, uh, Ben Gurion of this, you can check it out, right? He has a quotation where he says, you know, we want everyone to be safe here. The Arabs should be safe here. And he was making these comments. So therefore this is a lie that they were all forced out or there was some sort of design behind this or anything. He makes this kind of, uh, claim. So here, he says here, and I quote from page 54, he says, the Arabs, Ben Gurion asserted, had abandoned cities with great ease after the first defeat, even though no danger of destruction or massacre confronted them. Indeed, it was revealed with overwhelming clarity with, uh, which, people is bound, uh, with, uh, which people is bound with strong bonds to this land. So he, and this is a claim that he goes, they left out of their own accord. We didn't do anything. On this, he says, in fact, as we shall see presently, virtually every Arab settlement was abandoned precisely because of the danger of destruction or massacre. What is more, at the exact moment that Ben Gurion was sounding this major political conclusion, this is what Shapiro, this is again, these people are supposed to be political analysts, right? They're mm -hmm. supposed to know what the, you know, the, what's going on behind the scenes. We're Molvis, right? We're not supposed to be know this stuff. We're simpletons. So he goes, uh, danger of destruction and massacre. What is more, at the exact moment that Ben Gurion was sounding this major political conclusion, the Palmer uh, and the Palmer was the elite fi uh, fighting. I'm quoting this myself. Uh, just find what it was right. I have to check some of this stuff up. Was the first uh, was the elite fighting force of the Haganah, the underground army of the Jewish community during the period of the British Mandate. Mm -hmm. So that was while he was saying this comment, right? So this Palmer, which is uh, uh, was massacring some seventy Arab prisoners near Inzatun and several Arabs in the village itself. That's Benny Morris saying this. Mm -hmm. So as he was saying this comment, which Shapiro and these people cite, whilst that was happening, you have the Israeli, uh, the Jewish uh, community's army massacring Arabs, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it goes on. So he goes, Morris maintains that Jewish atrocities, although far more widespread than the old histories that let on, were none that limited in size and scope and time. So that's his conclusion he makes, which he critiques then. Mm -hmm. Okay, furthermore, furthermore, look at this. Morris writes, at Sabarin, uh, uh, sorry, at uh, uh, Sabarin, I might pronounce his name wrong, where Aizel, right, Aizel is referred to as Irgun Zivai Lumi, which is a Hebrew for National Military Organization, Jewish right wing underground movement in Palestine. Okay, this is what was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. So the Aizel, sounds like Aizel, right, met resistance. The villagers fled after 20, uh, after 20 died in the firefight. So this is during the war, what they're doing to the villages, people live in the Arab population that just happened to leave, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and an ISO armored car fired at the fleeing villagers. More, this is Benny Morris saying this, the Israeli, right? Who is pro-Israel. Because this happened so long ago, you can mention this stuff now. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. What are you going to do? They don't come back now, right? That's why when he's, when they talk, well, this is called the right of return. Yeah. That these guys have the right to return back. When this is mentioned to Benny, Mor uh, Benny Morris in the debate, he scoffs at it. He goes, what are you talking about? Mm. Come back, you will no longer be a Jewish state anymore. So he knows it's not going to happen. So you can mention the facts now. There's no problem, right? It's too late. So he goes, more than 100 old people, women and children who had not fled from Sabarin and the other villages were held for a few days behind barbed wire, an assembly point in Sabarin, after which they were expelled to Umul Fahm, a village in Arab held territory to the, to the southeast. The Jewish uh, troops combed the villages to assert that they were uh, empty and to make sure they stayed empty. 
An ISO officer at Umm Shauf, uh, Umm Shauf later recalled researching a column of refugees and finding a pistol and a rifle among the possessions. The troops detained seven young adult males and sent the rest of the column on its way to Umm Fahm. So they were expelled, they're taken out. The troops then demanded to know who the weapons belonged to. When the seven Arabs re refused to own up, the ISO men threatened to kill them. With no one owned up, the ISO officer held, uh, held a field court martial which sentenced the seven to death. The seven were then ex executed. Which clearly shows expulsion. What would you want? Exactly. All right. Yeah. And it goes on and on and on with you. I'm just going to mention um, a couple of more just to show the horrors of it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, he says after, he goes, Actually, if you were to believe Morris, Arab sources are generally not to be trusted. So that's what Boris goes, you can't trust Arab sources. So he goes, let's look at non-Arab sources then. What happened, right? Because uh, he's trying to, he's accepting that a lot of how bad stuff happened, but he doesn't want to accept the fact that it's completely designed. Yeah. And that's what he's critiquing here, right? So he goes, um, according to a UN source cited by Morris, civilian villagers at Fallujah had been beaten and robbed by Israeli soldiers. They had been, uh, there had been some cases of rape and Israeli troops had fired promiscuously, right? So there's cases of rape. Again, people talk about rape, et cetera, right? There's a history of this mm -hmm. that we're talking about. So part of the issue, people are getting raped. What are you going to think of the other Arab population there? They're going to happily leave. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, they're not going to leave, right? So the idea to leave out of that, and uh, I'm going to mention just um, uh, two, th three more points, and that's it on this part, right? Yeah. I know we're taking a lot of time, I apologize, but I, I think it's worth to go through the detail, right? So, um, so he mentions this issue of, and this is quite fascinating. Again, it's fascinating, but scary at the same time, right? So he says, uh, much ink has been spilled on the, uh, this is uh, Fikustin now, much ink has been spilled on the mass Arab exodus from Haifa in late April. There is no need to rehearse all the specific arguments here. For our purpose, the important point is that the events in Haifa generally confirm the pattern of terror, assault, and exposure described above. Intercommunal strife in Haifa first peaked in December 1947 with an unprovoked attack by Ergen members on a crowd of Arab um, refinery workers. By April, some 15 to 20,000 ha uh, of Haifa, 70,000 strong Palestinian community had uh, uh, already uh, fled the city. As hostilities continued to escalate, in accordance with Plan D, the, uh, the Haganah launched its major offensive against Haifa on 21st April. Attacking Jewish forces, listen to this, right? Attacking Jewish forces made liberal use of psychological warfare and terror tactics. We have already noted the ghastly scene near the port, uh, the, the port area. Jeeps were, also, uh, Jeeps were also brought in broadcasting, recording horror sounds, right? So you basically have these horror sounds. What are they? Including shrieks and wails and anguish moans of Arab women. The wails of uh, uh, the sirens and the clunk of fire alarm bells interrupted by uh, a, a voice calling out in Arabic. Save yourselves, O ye faithful. Flee for your lives. Right? According to the eyewitness accounts of uh, uh, one of the, uh, the officers and threats to use uh, poison gas and atomic weapons against the Arabs. Right? So you imagine this. You're, you're living there and you have this uh, sound coming out. We hear shrieks and screams, etc. And you have some Arab voice, uh, voice in Arabic saying, flee. And the list goes on. And I'm just going to mention uh, just um, one last one. There's another quotation of Ben-Gurion that affirms this, that he was okay with it. Mm -hmm. All right? He mentions that as well. But I just want to mention this last, this is probably one of the most horrific ones that I read, where he says, uh, one commander, this is uh, cited by Benny Morris now, this is not Finkelstein now, Benny Morris citing this himself. He goes, one commander ordered a, uh, a uh, sapper to put two old women in a certain house and blow up the house with them. Okay? The sapper refused. The commander then ordered his men to put an old woman and the evil deed was done. One soldier boasted that he had raped a woman and that, then shot her. One woman with a newborn baby in her arms was employed to clear the courtyard where the soldiers ate. She worked a day or two. In the end, they shot her and her baby. Right? Talking about baby deaths and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They shot her baby. The soldiers I went to conclude that cultured, cultured officers had turned into base murderers and this is not the heat of battle but out of system of explosion and destruction. The less Arabs remained, the better. The principle is a political motor for the explosion of the atrocities. So the idea of the theory of Zionism, what we cited, and then you see the practice of the exposure. So this is what we're talking about. Yeah. So, and again, this is just citing a few stuff. You can go through it, the list and list of, of so the, 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 the original refugee problem is a creation of the state of Israel. Yeah. And there's very little thing you can debate about. That's why I'm saying is Finkelstein doesn't bother talking about this much. Yeah. Because of the fact that he thinks it's set scholarship, right? But I think for most of us, it's his news. I think even even for when when uh, you have that recent 
and discussion with Piers Morgan, etc., uh, with Mohammed Hijab. And the way he's discussing the whole issue is he's starting from seventh of Oct- uh, the, the Saturday. Yeah, he's starting from Saturday, and that's how he's going to frame the whole discussion. Mm. Whereas this whole narrative, which he probably is aware of, I'm not sure. Uh, we, so. we 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 don't know, right? Yeah, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But this whole whole narrative that's come before that provides us this background context, right? It allows a person then to have some perspective that, hang on a minute. This is what they've gone through. This is in their collective memory as mm. a people. And uh, if you take that away from them and just say that this is happening in a vacuum, then you're completely misrepresenting the issue. Exactly. Exactly. This is what needs to be cited whenever, uh, you know, pro-Israeli or pro-Zionist um, rhetoric is sounded. Mm. These are the things that need to be sound, like cited in order to show them that no, it's not happening oh, in a yeah. vacuum. So these ideas of, you know, baby rapes and stuff like that. And yeah. you can see these are... And this goes on. You can see all the the cases that we're talking about, which are documented. And we're only going to stop here yeah. for this book. You can carry on, right? There's more uh, about what happens in the the later wars with the Arabs and what the, the background where there was a need for peace, what they want. Mm-hmm. So the general notion they're trying to get from this is that the idea of expansion of taking the whole of is something that comes quite intrinsic to the idea of Zionism. So when you see that, why are they not letting them have peace? Why are they not? Why are they in a blockade, etc.? Because there is an there is a um, the, the the state is built upon this notion of expansionism, of taking what this what is theirs in essence, what they believe to be theirs. Mm. So therefore, these kind of constant attacks, you know, uh, even right now, hoping that they can just get out, and then we can somehow slowly. And that what happens is with, with like with any of these type of forms of conquering that takes place because first we're not in the era of empires anymore so we want to talk about the Islamic ethics of this we can do this inshallah there's no problem right mm-hmm. but here we're talking about packs that were made a land that was given that was by uh, you know uh, unethical whites and then how it was done was illegal right all of these things are very well established so with international law and uh, these things are not upheld there's a very interesting paper that was written by Dr. Sherman Jackson back in I think it's the 90s or, uh, 2000s I think it was post 2001 uh, 2000, uh, post 9-11 and he was talking about how um, the paper, the, the the era of the past, the era of empires. It was understand of conquering, you get conquered, and that's how, and you make pacts, etc. Right? In the modern world, we are told that no, the default now is between peace. There's such thing as uh, you know people have the si- or the right of self determination. Uh, but then he makes a very interesting point, saying that's fair. So let's say we accept that, that we have uh, by agreement we should not be going and attacking random people, random cities, countries, etc. We should, we should um, uphold these values. But then he mentioned the point. He goes, but the people in power have to do it by, they have the responsibility to do so. So it's like if you have an institution and the head teacher is not living going up to scratch, you can't expect other teachers to be doing the same. Mm. So if we're looking and saying, right, these are people in power and they are contravening international law and the people that are meant to be upholding the international police, which is Britain or US, are not living up to that standard. They're not enforcing the law. Then naturally, why should I care about the law? Mm-hmm. We become anarchy. Mm -hmm. And that's how all anarchy begins. Is that the second I start to see that the police are are, are picking on me or picking on my people and they don't care about crimes I've done against me, what's going to happen eventually is I'm not going to care about the police anymore. I'm taking to my own house. Right? Because there's no need to go down that route. So if you've failed a people, so in this case, for example, so now we have uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people that have been kicked out, uh, take kicked out of the land and they're not allowed back in. And they haven't been allowed back in. Mm-hmm. So hasn't the international community failed them? So why should they now be trusting the international community for help now? Even though we look at this anyway, but what I'm saying is the mindset that you're creating amongst people, then the shock and the horror and the surprise about when something happens is what baffle, it's not actually baffling them, right? It's, 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 oh, it doesn't baffle me. It's, it's a fake reaction. Yeah, it's a fake. Right? It's not real baffling. Fake confusion. Right? Yeah, it's, it's just a, uh, and there's many uh, examples of this. But anyway, inshallah, yeah. let's move on. We've been speaking this quite a while. Yeah. We can move on to our book on regarding uh, Gaza, inshallah. Regarding Gaza. Now, Gaza is markedly different to the West Bank, which is probably why he's written his book specifically on Gaza. Yeah, we can do it on, yeah. there's, there's got discussion on the West Bank. So these are other books I mentioned of his that discuss various aspects of it. Yeah. Uh, but this is specifically on Gaza. Uh, on Gaza and because uh, this was published in 2018, I want to say. Okay. All right, I believe so. No, 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 sorry. sorry. Yeah, 2018. Yeah, 2018, yeah. So talk about five years ago. So of course, uh, there's some a lot of things have happened since then, but he's not uh, documented that. 
Um, I've been listening to some of his uh, recent um, uh, commentary as well, uh, which is also I advise everyone to listen to. It's very powerful. A lot of the content in here is summarized. Uh, so I'm going to try to not repeat some of the stuff he said. So if mm -hmm. you listen to him, it's great. But I'm going to try to mention some stuff in the book, which is a bit different to what he said, but it's going to be a lot of overlap. But it's well worth a listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he does actually make this interesting point that uh, in 2020, he kind of gave up on it. He spent 40 years and he's like, well, <laughs> I've presented what I could present. No one seems to be that bothered anymore. And that's why when we're talking about uh, these um, the normalization of um, relationship with Israel, again, I'm not a political commentator, right? So I'm not going to mention this is what the solution is, what isn't the solution. That's not my job. And also, I'm not going to say what Palestinians should or shouldn't do. I think that's, we can talk about this after, but if you want, we can mention it quickly now. Is that, again, it's the same thing that we're living in comfort, comfortable, like we're sitting here comfortably, right? Belly's full, uh, warm, no threat, well, anything I can have, of course, right? But we're not living in such a thing, right? Uh, you know, I was just thinking about like um, kids are asleep, comfortable, anything can happen, but we have this kind of comfort or some sense of comfort at least. And then we're sitting here and saying, well, you should fight mm -hmm. or you shouldn't fight. That's or unwise. Providing this critiques is wise. on yeah, what Yeah, critiques and saying, oh, you know, we condemn you. But, and it's, uh, you know, people ask, what's the hukum shari for this, right? Like, what's the ruling of what Hamas did. What, 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 what would you say about that? And what I want to try to show, inshallah, is that there's a reason why we should bite our tongue. Not because uh, for this, Allah's law doesn't matter. Of course it matters. So if there is, of course, killing of babies and what we've been told, right, then no problem, right? Allah's law comes first. We don't, you know, bend away for that for any reason. But at the same time, we say, where is our information coming from? And the people that are telling us this, What's their track record? Mm -hmm. And this is what I want to get to here now. What's their vested interest? Yeah, because when we look at um, political commentary, the reason why it's very difficult, I, like I said, I don't go on Twitter much, but this week I have, and it's not good for your health, yeah. right? It's not good for you at all. I don't know how people do it generally, right? It's just too much. Read a book, it's better. Go on Twitter, random comments, fake information, all sorts, right? And so you're looking through it and you think, well, how do I make sense of this information? But luckily and unluckily, I would say, is that luckily we've got, uh, data to tell us how exactly we should deal with this, mm -hmm. right? Because this is not the first attack. We've got, you know, ample um, data to go through to say, what do, what happens in these wars? Who instigates it? Mm -hmm. What's actually happening? And we've got documentation of all of that. So therefore, when you read that, and then you see the same points being reiterated, you say, oh, we've seen this trick before, mm -hmm. right? We've, we've, we've seen this before. I've seen the same argument we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Right, this notion of you know when something happens, spend the first uh, twenty eight hours, forty eight hours denying, claiming whatever you want to claim, say whatever ridiculous comment you want to say, it doesn't matter because you've made the water work, or you've made the water murky. In three days, time, no one's going to care. Yeah, right. So, for example, and I'm not, uh, you know, we, uh, we, it sounds very unlikely, right? But the idea of the uh, because we're talking about just after the attack on the um, hospital. Well, let's look at three things here, and we're going to touch upon this, right? If I can prove, or we can demonstrate that there were attacks done on hospitals, right? If I can demonstrate that. If I can, uh, before in the past by Israel, mm -hmm. I can demonstrate that um, there wasn't any, uh, there's evidence of attacking hospitals where there's no evidence that Hamas were in or any terrorists were in. If you can demonstrate first hospitals, and then the second point that there was not done in uh, because of any terrorists, if I can demonstrate that point. And then if I can talk about the effectiveness of rockets, with those three, if I can say they're not effective enough to do the damage that that's been claimed. Mm -hmm. With those three facts, right, what should be my slant when it comes to this position? Yeah. If I can demonstrate that. That it's most likely in Israel. 100%. But of course, it's very hard for us to do commentary because it's ongoing. Yeah. But I'm saying is we can actually make informed decisions and say, well, this seems to be what's most likely. Yeah. Right? Could it be something ra radically different? Of course it could do. But that's what I'm saying is let's not do current commentary. Let the, those who are good at that expert, let them do that. Mm -hmm. Right? But let's see what happened in the past and see if we can take lesson for that what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what we're going to look at. Yeah. Okay? Right. And I think if we're going to do that, we're going to start from the beginning. So, uh, or not the beginning, beginning, but the beginning of when these kind of conflict spats, you can say, arise so you have previous operations like Operation Cast Lead, Operation Protective Edge, which I think are the case studies that he focuses yeah. on uh, in the book. Um, now he mentions those two, and then he starts off by discussing uh, initially uh, what 
is the justification for the Israeli or the Zionist response. Mm. So he says that, you know, there's an instigation that occurs. Yeah. And the narrative is then built that this instigation. Ha- so essentially the Palestinians are, or Hamas, who's in charge of the Palestinian territory, has bought this on themselves. Yeah. They've, they've bought on this response themselves. It's their fault. So we, we know, for example, that from um, 2005, uh, you originally had settlers in uh, Gaza. So from, there's, a, there's offensive there. So this is before Hamas. Yeah. Right. And there's been, uh, so when you're talking about attacks and the whole thing being Hamas, Hamas, um, before Hamas, the attacks were there. But, but this explosion that we're talking about mm-hmm. that took place, there was no Hamas there, mm-hmm. right? There was villages, right? There was the, the, the woman and the baby that was killed, that was not Hamas. So the question does come about is, well, who are these? Uh, what, if it was Hamas, everything, but that it may explain what's happened over the last 17 years, but it doesn't explain the rest. That's yeah, number one, right? Exactly. Number two is that, what is the situation that uh, Hamas is in? So in the first page, Right, he mentions this point just to just give a bit of an image of what Hamas is. So he goes, Gaza is bordered by Israel on the north and east, Egypt on the south. And we're not going to excuse Arab nations here, right? But we're just talking because our purposes of the current conflict. And the Mediterranean Sea on the west. Approximately 250,000 Palestinians driven out of their homes during the 1948 war fled to Gaza and overwhelmed the indigenous population of some 80,000. So 80,000. And then what happens? 250,000 re- refugees. Mm-hmm. Today, more than 70% of Gaza inhabitants consist of expellees from the 1948 war and their descendants. And more than half of this overwhelmingly refugee population is under 18 years of age. This is from 2018. Mm-hmm. Gaza has the second highest share of people aged between 0 to 14 worldwide. Yep. Right? Uh, so that means a lot of the people right now living there have spent their whole life yeah. in the blockade. Yeah. Right? Its current 1.8 million inhabitants, which is now 2.2 we talk about, this is five years ago, right? Are squeezed into a sliver of land of 25 miles long and five miles wide. It is among the most densely populated areas in the world, more crowded than even Tokyo. Between 1967, when the Israeli occupation began, and 2005, when Prime Minister Eru Sharon deployed Israeli troops from inside Gaza to its perimeter, Israel imposed on Gaza a uniquely exploitive regime of de-development, the term he uses. So it's not to develop the country, it's to de-develop it, Mm -hmm. to make it go backwards. In the words of Harvard political economist Sarah Roy, it deprived the native population of its most important economic resources, land, water, and labor, as well as the internal capacity and potential for development of those resources. Again, if you hear people saying, it's Hamas's fault, Hamas, are we going to say that there are, are we to believe that they're going to be corrupt people in in places like Palestine that may take people's wealth? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like everywhere, right? Are we saying that's where the problem is? Mm. No, right? So he goes, the road to modern Gaza's desperate plight is strewn with multiple atrocities, long, most long forgotten unknown outside Palestine. And then he goes into talking about it. So they, they, and then he also cites uh, scholars who have confirmed, uh, sorry, human rights organizations. They have confirmed by the analysis that uh, the blockade on uh, Gaza is an illegal blockade. So if it's illegal, where can there be citation of law? Exactly. If the blockade is illegal, how can then resistance be told me to go by law? Mm-hmm. You've blocked me off, which everyone's saying is illegal. But the second I do something is illegal, you're saying law. Why should I care about the law? That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying is it becomes very difficult for a person living there to care about law and international law when clearly the blockade itself is illegal, which is not being lifted. Mm-hmm. And the claim, as you see, in the, you mentioned in the book, and again, I advise people to read it. It's a very thorough read. It's a tedious read because it's just t- information after information after information. But it will take a number, of, like a number of days, if not a week or two, to read it. Some people still read it two, three weeks. Is that if the blockade, every aspect is responded to. If the blockade was of just weapons, then fair enough. But the blockade is of food. The blockade is of water. The blockade is of aid. Right? Hamas are not going to. Uh, you know, uh, have a food fight with you and kill you based on with apples and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So we're saying that the blockade is of all aspects. So if it is a, uh, so this is why we refer to it as illegal blockade. Mm-hmm. So how can a, a place prosper when we have blocked from, and we'll see other examples of this, inshallah. So that's uh, point number one. Yeah. Point number two that I want to mention, inshallah, is that before um, Hamas, right, we mentioned already the 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 second, um, uh, Intifada, mm-hmm. right, which is an uprising. And he mentions the uprising here. And he says, in September 2000, amid the diplomatic statement, stalemate after long provocation, 
Palestine and the occupied territories once again entered into open revolt. Like its 1987 precursor, the second in, uh, in Fita, uh, um, Intifada was at its inception overwhelmingly non-violent. However, in Ben Ami's words, Israel's disproportionate response to what has started as a popular uprising with young unarmed men confronting Israeli soldiers armed with lethal weapons fuel the second intifada beyond control and turn it into all-out war. Who's saying this? It's Ben Ami, who's an Israeli, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, uh, anyway, yeah, so, so this is just to mention it's before Hamas, right? So again, people say that it's, uh, it's not provoked, right? We're talking about non-violent uh, where it started off as, and then five months later mm -hmm. of the Intifada instigated, that's when you had your suicide bombings. Mm -hmm. So but what's happened is that when you hear about the Intifada, people talk about suicide bombings. But after this, five months later, the suicide bombings began. Mm -hmm. So you talk about provocations, so where do you start from? Do you start with Pierce and say, but isn't suicide bombing like disgusting? Mm -hmm. Isn't it horrible? You think if the people had those weapons, they'll be doing suicide bombings? Is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. Right. Again, this is uh, you know it's a it's a it's a bizarre rereading of history. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. And then uh, this this narrative then gets pushed uh, where a person is expected to believe now that it is Hamas's fault. Yeah. Um, and they and if Hamas is at fault, then the people who put them there are at fault by extension. Yeah. Which is the Palestinians. So then everyone is culpable, mm -hmm. and everyone is liable to get blown up basically. yeah so he discusses this in quite some detail and we're not going to reiterate this you'll see him mention in his, in his book here about how hamas came into power how they were shocked by it and then uh how even hillary clinton uh was exposed as saying that they should have rigged it basically right it's all cited and documented here uh thereafter and these are not conspiracies so let's be clear here right mm -hmm. when i mention conspiracy i'll be very clear as a conspiracy these are factored documentation but like i said people forget that's how we that's how we operate right mm -hmm. human beings are forgetful beings so we forget so um what he demonstrates is that, so let's move on a bit, yeah. right? To Because there's a lot of detail here. And uh, until we get to, so 2006, Hamas come into power. And then in 2008, 2009, you have what is called Operation Cast Lead. Yeah. And what uh, Fikerstein demonstrates throughout this work is to show that uh, the reason why Cast Lead, which is so lethal, right? Was that in uh, a couple of years earlier, uh, in 2006, uh, Israel had went into war with Hezbollah. And with Hezbollah, they had, uh, more or less been defeated or they would have um, Hezbollah thought it was a victory and they and you can probably argue that it was a victory mm -hmm. and so there's embarrassment so the idea was that Israel is no longer a deterrent mm -hmm. so because if you lost we're not a deterrent anymore so he cites you know various uh, Israeli officials saying this that we need to bring back our deterrent which is the fact that fear of the Arabs against us and so how best to do so is to instigate uh, provocation with um, with Hamas mm -hmm. and go to war and demonstrate and do indiscriminate fight, uh, kidding. So what he does, what he shows here is on page 23, um, he says that in the, he goes, when Israel killed 55 Lebanese during the first two days of the 2006 war, it killed as many as 300 Gazans in just four minutes on the first day of cast lead. And what he, he also uh, argues here, and not argue, but he demonstrates here, is that the uh, Operation Cast Lead, which was in 2008, uh, was, uh, it was followed by a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. So it was a ceasefire. And it was Israelis who broke the ceasefire. Yes. And because this is a factual point. So the ceasefire was broken by Israelis, and then you got the rockets. Mm -hmm. And then Cast Lead began. So he goes, what's the need to provoke? It was the idea of deterrent. So we want to have a reason to uh, provoke him. Then as a deterrent, we can demonstrate our power. Yeah. So cast lead is brutal because of this, right? So he provides, uh, you know, many examples of indiscriminate uh, killing, which I'll uh, explain. So he goes, for example, on the first day, Israeli airstrikes, is cast lead right now, right? Strike killed or fatally injured at least 16 children. While an Israeli drone launched pre a precision missile, uh, missile killed nine college students, two of them young women, who were waiting for a UN bus to take them home. Human Rights Watch, so these are the, uh, the, the Human Rights Watch, or the, 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 the human rights organizations, right? So these are independent. Mm -hmm. Found that no Palestinian fighter were active on the street or in the immediate area just prior to or at the time of the attack, right? So these colleagues, there's no one there. And that's what they did. And you're going to find this example over and over and over again. I think even so the, just now, they, they had this, um, they, they have a couple of quotes from officials where they say the emphasis is on damage. We're not looking yeah. for precision. Even though they will say on their, their, their media lion toe will be, 
we are positioned uh, targeting systems we're targeting Hamas depots of weapons or whatever not but when you look at what the officials are saying in their own circles or in, in on Israeli channels damage yeah and so you know the moral equivalence argument saying mm -hmm. that oh they they target civilians I will come to this as well right yeah. uh, but we target them but they get civilians again this is the, the data shows completely the opposite mm. and again it's an independent human rights organization so these are not these are not Hamas telling us this. You people that go in there, and that's what that's why I'm saying it's difficult to do current commentary because once the damage is done, a few months down the line, you're going to start having the reports come out, and then you're going to find out what actually. By that time, like I said, most people are not going to care. Eighty nine percent of people are not going to read, and the people are dead right? by that time. They're dead. But I'm saying is readers as those yeah. uh, people like us are going to we're not going to be bothered in eighty nine uh, in uh, eighty nine percent of us. Mm. Us ourselves, for example, I was quite young when Castell happened, but let's say Protective Edge, where I could have read. I didn't go for the human rights, so, uh, and that's my weakness. The fact that you know, once it's done, it's like, okay, it's done. What can you do now, right? So these, when these uh, reports come out, we know something dodgy happened, yeah. or we're not bothering with it. And that's why when you when they said you know people like Pierce and people in the journalists, I do think there's a gender, most definitely. But I also think that because the journalists, they go after event, event, event. Mm -hmm. Once the event's done, they're not going to do research after that. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not excusing them of uh, you know saying that they're innocent. I'm just saying is that. Part of being a journalist, and this is is that you're going after events. So right now, you've exposed to this. Once the human rights uh, reports come out, you're not reading that there's because you got event. a new story. Yeah, there's a different event going on. Yeah, it's a new different. So that's what I mean is that I'm not uh, going to fully. But I'm pretty sure these guys. Yeah, who cares, man? These guys are idiots anyway. Uh, during cast led, Israel reported co uh, repeatedly caught misrepresenting among many other things is deploying white phosphorus. This is well established. Definitely. So when we talk about do Israel have a history of lying, the answer is yes. Right, and there's many uh, evidence. I'm just mentioning one of them. Yeah. Right, there's examples of this. So there's evidence of lying. So yes. So therefore, should we be skeptical of what we hear? Yes. Mm -hmm. So should I give a fatwa on someone? No. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the Quran says that min nabain fatabayyanu. If a fasiq a, a sinner comes to you with a report, then verify. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you actually read the background, it's far less than anything that is uh, what's being reported to exactly. us. Exactly. Right. So anyway. And just not on that. The white phosphorus is what is still being used in this current conflict. Yeah, they've used it uh, on Palestinians, so it's still a clear breach of international. Let me read law. off. I've got actually put it here. I said what, uh, what, what is white phosphorus a highly inflammable chemical substance, yeah. which is dispersed in artillery shells, bombs, and rockets and ignitions, which when exposed to oxygen. So with oxygen, you can't fill it with water. When not uh, while not classified as a chemical weapon, it causes severe burns, often down to the bone, and yep. can reignite when exposed to oxygen. Okay. Right. So that's what we're talking about. So it that, was, burns that was for that was that was. Uh, it said that it didn't happen yeah. And then oh yeah it did happen Right um, Anyway So you have you know Mixed reports have come in Right yeah. Everyone's finished talking about it uh, It did happen Yeah Right Now um, Something that interesting happens Is that after the um, Cast led This operation that takes place in 2008 Which goes into great detail Is that uh, This uh, uh, This comes out Which is known as uh, The testimony of IDF soldiers Which is known as Breaking the silence mm -hmm. Where a bunch of IDF soldiers, they ex this is the in, in, uh, Israel Defense Force, they come out and they ex they tell us what what they did, right? So it comes out, and again, this happens after when no one's reading now, right? So it's only those people that are interested or maybe in Israel, they maybe care about. No one else cares, so they're boasting about what happens. Mm -hmm. So he says here, he goes based on the journalists and human rights organizations found, and when Israeli uh, and what Israeli soldiers in the field later testified, however, a radically different picture of caste comes to release. So he mentions the official narrative, then he goes, what actually happened? So he goes, we find that the Israeli soldiers, as this is by, uh, so this is referenced by um, breaking the, uh, the silence, soldiers testimony from Operation Cast Lead, right? This is uh, published in Jerusalem 2009, uh, and he mentioned the testimonies of this, right? This is uh, mentioned from there. He goes, uh, we're going to war, a company commander told his soldiers before the attack. I want aggressiveness. If there's someone suspicious on the upper floor of a house, we'll just shell it. If we have suspicions about a house, we'll take it down. There'll be no hesitation. A combatant remembered a meeting with his brigade commander and others with the rule of engagement were essentially conveyed us. If you see any signs of movement at all, you shoot. Other soldiers recalled, if the deputy battalion commander thought a house looked suspect, we'd blow it away. If the infantry men didn't like the look of that house, we'd shoot. If you face an area that is hidden by a building, you take the building down. Questions about such as who lives in that building are not asked. Soldier recalling his brigade commander's order. As for the rules of engagement, the army's working assumption was that the whole area would be devoid of civilians, right? Anyone there, as far as the army was concerned, was to be killed. 
It's an identified, unidentified soldier. Mm. We were told any sign of danger, open, by, open up with massive fire. Um, we shot at anything that moved. Despite the fact that no one fired on us, the firing and demolition continued incessantly. Uh, essentially, if a person only needed to be in the problematic location, a highest reporter, uh, a mainstream Israeli newspaper, found, a rep found in circumstances that can be broadly be seen as suspicious for him to be incriminated and affect sentence to death. Right, so this is this is what happened. This is from their own uh, admission uh, of what we find, and I'm going to go on, inshallah. Right, so there's a yeah. number of things we'll mention. Right, so uh, he continues. Right, the argument. Now we're going to move on to the self, uh, the, yeah. the human shields. Yeah. Right, and there's a bunch of arguments I mentioned that uh, Hamas use human shields. The argument now is that we're going to look at is is this factually correct? Mm -hmm. Right, are Hamas using human shields or are they not? Now. The typical response that people give when they talk about this, they say that, well, um, there is nowhere for anybody to go. Yeah. So they're not going to go into a field yeah. and start fighting in the open when the bombs are raining down. That's on fine. That's fine. Yeah. So the densely populated area where exactly. you meant to go. Exactly. But despite that, we have very specific uh, evidence to the contrary. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about ambulances first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was it was argued in a um, cast led that they were using ambulances. So he says, the normally discreet international, this is Finkerson saying this, the normally discreet International Committee of the Red Cross issued a public rebuke of Israel after a shocking incident in which Israeli soldiers turned back a Red Cross rescue team dispatched to aid, uh, aid injured civilians. You can't go in. Leaving them to die. The Al-Mizan Center for Human Rights tallied that Israel's systematic obstruction of medical access during the invasion caused the deaths of at least 258 Gazans. Right? This is medical facilities we're talking about. So again, do Israel attack hospitals, etc., right? But did a Hamas commander, he asks, and make nefarious use of ambulances? That's what we were told at that time in 2008. Um, he goes, the Israeli brief contended that Hamas made extensive use of ambulances, bearing the protective emblem of the Red Cross and Red Crescent to transport operatives and weaponry. So they were using it. So we just shot at them because they were using the Red Cross, etc. The only independent proof it could muster, however, didn't exactly overwhelm. A fabulating Italian reporter on the one hand and a Gazan ambulance driver who recounted how Hamas militants sought unsuccessfully to commandeer a, vehicle on the, on the, uh, commandeer a vehicle on the other. The Israeli brief goes so far as to allege that the IDF refrained from attacking medical vehicles even in cases where Hamas and other terrorist organizations were using them for military purposes. That's how far they claim. Remember, the, the mm. da'wah is so far-fetched that you think the truth is something in between. Yeah. That's what you try to include that, right? Go back, right? But if the IDF didn't target ambulances commanded by Hamas for military purposes, and if there is absolutely no doubt that the IDF targeted a large number of ambulances, then the ambulances targeted must not have been used for military purposes. The argument that Palestinian abuse ambulances have been raised numerous times by Israeli officials, but Selim, which is the Israeli human rights organization, says. Although Israel has almost never presented evidence to prove it. Right? Furthermore, he gives some other evidences for this, right? He goes, still, did a Hamas militant fire from and take refuge in hospitals? Mm. Like this, right? It says vast accounts of information from both intelligence sources and reports from IDF forces on the ground, Israel contended, show that Hamas did in fact make extensive uh, military use of hospitals and other medical facilities. But according to Amnesty International, right, human rights organization, independent uh, human rights organization, organization, Israeli officials did not provide evidence for even one such case. Amnesty itself found no evidence during its on-the-ground investigation that such practices, if they did occur, were widespread. Physician for Human Rights Israel did not find any evidence supporting Israel's official claim the hospitals were used to conceal political or military personnel. The Goldstone report, which we'll come back to in a second, right, did not find any evidence to support them because Goldstone, right, Richard Goldstone was a, is a Zionist, pro-Israeli Zionist. He wrote a report, right? He's going to talk about extensively. He talks extensively about this book. So this guy, after his analysis, pro-Israeli Zionist, right, his daughter lives in Israel, right? He says. He did not find any evidence to support the allegation the hospital facility was used by Gaza or by the Gaza authorities or by Palestinian armed groups or sh to shield military activities. And he further he just goes on. I can't, you know how much you're going to read, yeah. right? And uh, he demonstrates what argument after argument that this was not uh, something that was used. Yeah. Furthermore, right on page fifty-eight, you can see uh, just before you go on, you, like just so that we can link it to what's going on now, because. The whole point of this is that we can see these tropes being used over and over again. And when uh, the hospital was attacked yesterday uh, and it was bombed, the question came out onto social media channels, Twitter, and even through the news is that in Israeli uh, intelligence agencies are now investigating whether the uh, 
exp- the bigger explosion that was caused was because of a weapons cache. That was a, a question that they were asking. You can ask anything. Yeah. That's the point. The, yeah. What this kind of demonstrates is that you can say whatever you like. Yeah. Because there is no counter to it. It's going to take too long for the counter to come out. Exactly. So on the discussion of human shields, I want to mention this quote from Amnesty International, right? Yeah. There's a human shields. So if anyone asks about human shields again, just present this quotation to them, right? So what Amnesty International say, I know it's getting very long and tedious, but that's the nature of these studies. Yeah. The, the, uh, to lie is easy, to unravel the truth is tedious. Right, so I can come out with the claim and say you are a murderer, to, and that's easy for me to lie. For you to exonerate yourself takes a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So I know people are getting. If someone's got this far in the video, great. But I know people are tired. T- I'm tired, right? But this is, and I'm still only on page uh, 50, uh, seventy that I'm citing from. There's a whole hefty level of the book. I'm not going to mention everything, yeah. right? I've highlighted throughout the whole book. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to mention this because on human shields, mm-hmm. and hopefully we can make this into smaller segments so people can you know swallow and we can have actually. Uh, timestamps this time. He says, contrary to repeat allegation by Israeli officials of the use of human shields, Amnesty International found no evidence that Hamas or any Palestinian fighter, any Palestinian fighters, directed the movement of civilians to shield military objectives from attacks. It found no evidence that Hamas or other armed groups forced residents to stay in or around buildings used by fighters. We hit all the time. Hamas don't allow people to leave. Found no evidence of this. Nor that fighters prevented residents from leaving buildings or areas which had been com- uh, commandeered by militants. Because you're going to ask people, were you forced to stay? No, we weren't, mm. right? Did it? Could it have happened once or twice? Of course it could have happened once or twice. It's mm-hmm. a war. We get that, right? Is this a, uh, a, a structural thing that's happened, a systematic policy? thing? It's not. Mm. Amnesty International delegates interviewed by many Palestinians who complained about Hamas's conduct, and especially Hamas's repression and attacks against their opponents, including killings, torture, and arbitrary detentions, meaning people that are opposed to Hamas. So they interviewed them, Amnesty International, not people that were supposed to Hamas. They would probably lie and say, well, fair enough, right? Opponents are saying that they torture us, they're repressive, etc. We're not here to exonerate Hamas as the ideal it's, uh, you know, Muslim rule, etc. We're not mm-hmm. saying that, right? Mm-hmm. That's between them for the decide. I don't know what's going on there, right? In the sense of uh, internal politics. So they asked them, uh, but they don't receive any accounts of Hamas fighters having used them as human shields, right? In the case of Vespa Amnesty International, civilian killed in Israeli attacks, the deaths could not be explained as resulting from the presence of fighters shooting among civilians because they found so many cases of civilians because there's no militants around. Yeah. Right? And then you got, then, um, this is something which I found, uh, you know, fascinating, but again, it's, it's crazy, right? If you listen to this point, I, I, I apologize for the length. If it is, uh, if, uh, if, it, if it found no evidence, this is Norman Fickerson saying this now, right? If it found no evidence that Hamas used human shields, Amnesty did, however, find ample evidence that Israel used them. SubhanAllah. Listen to this. The Israeli defense avowed that the rules of engagement of the Israel Defense Force, IDF, strictly forbade the use of civilians as human shields, and that the IDF took a variety of measures to teach and instill awareness of these rules of engagement in commanders and soldiers. That's what they said. Mm-hmm. But in fact, Israeli soldiers, now he quotes Amnesty International, used civilians, including children, as human shields, endangering their lives were forced into remain or in near houses which they took over and used as military positions. Some were forced to carry out dangerous tasks such as inspecting properties or objects subject of being booby-trapped. So they'll say to a guy, come here, go look in that house, what's happening, right? You go in first, and then we'll, as human, sh- that's definitely a human shield. Mm. I, I'll shield myself, I'll send you in. Mm. Soldiers also took position and launched attacks from and around inhabited houses, exposing local, res- local residents to dangers of attacks or of being caught in the crossfire. That's Amnesty International. Other human rights in- uh, investigations, so this is not just one source, right? In particular, the Graphic Council Goldstone Report and the, uh, the post-invasion testimony of Israeli soldiers corroborate the IDF's use of human shields. Right? And you find other lengthy quotations uh, to the fact, how long do you want to go on for, right? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, for the fear of saying it bores you, right? But I think it should enrage a person, exactly. but I do get that. And then this uh, chapter, which is called the Goldstone Report, that he goes in, this is a guy called Richard Goldstone. Hmm. And when you read this, this sounds like the verse in the Quran, وَشَهِدَ الشَّاهِدُ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Mm. Right, that a is that the verse? You're reading it right, yeah. Uh, that a witness from their own home testifies. Mm. So this causes a massive uproar because you have human rights organization, Amnesty, or your anti-Semitic, and for some reason, right, Human Rights Watch, your pro Hamas, or your terrorist sympathy. You can say these terms, and you can get real. Which, by the way, but you can actually view their reports and the evidence is in there. But anyway, the Goldstone was a, is a Zionist, right, pro Israel. So he carries out a investigation on. Operation Cast Lead, and he provides damning, and I say damning is the thing, uh, uh, a um, um, 
point on a, a damning report of, of Operation Cast Lead. Mm -hmm. And this caused a massive stir mm. because it's big, because, it's a rep the, because the image is important. That's why when yeah. I go back to the issue of um, uh, Pearson that we spoke about before, why we were so harsh to him, is that these comments do matter mm -hmm. because you they, they need those support because independently they can't do much. They need US et cetera, support. So if you have influencers that are saying these things, it does make an impact. Public, public opinion. Public opinion is very important here, right? So Goldstone, who is a respected figure, comes out with this report, who's a testifying themselves. Allah says this is so useful for Islam, right? And their own family member says that it bears witness. So here, uh, Goldstone bears witness. And he gives this damning report. And the tactics they use on him to try to discredit is immense. And he meticulously goes through it. Right. If anyone has any respect for the likes of Obama, or Clinton, still or Hillary Clinton, right? You know, after reading this, that should completely diminish as well the way they kind of try to dismiss these reports, etc. Wow. And eventually, he has to come out in the so he d details it. He tries to come out eventually after years of or having longer years of pressure. He goes, okay, I, I retract some of it, wow. and then he goes through the retraction, say, is the retraction justified or not? Mm -hmm. So Ficusin goes meticulously through that. And he argues this case. But there's a one interesting quote that I want to uh, kind of uh, cite. Uh, hopefully, we're trying to finish up now, inshallah. Yeah. Right? Because um, the human shield comes up again. I'll mention that as well. And then the second thing. But uh, on the idea of moral equivalence, mm -hmm. all right? And there's an interesting section here on page 89. So it's not just a damning. So he goes on, of course, he criticizes Hamas as well, saying, you guys target civilians and you've done your stuff. Well, no problem, right? So he does mention that. But there's a uh, footnote here that uh, Finkelstein mentioned, which I think is quite useful. He goes, the Dugard community held Hamas culpable of war crimes, such as indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks on civilians and killing, wounding, and terrorizing civilians. However, it entered the caveat that a number of factors reduced their moral blameworthiness, but not their criminal responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying is if something is established, mm -hmm. we can talk about the hurma, the prohibition of something, the sharia. Mm -hmm. But when we condemn a person, we have to look at the, the wider uh, the, the nuances, etc. here. Right? It's like the woman that comes to the Messenger of Allah and says that I commit zina. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the exact equivalent, but the idea here I'm saying is, right? So when she uh, does toba and she's then given uh, punishment, you see some sahaba are angry at her. They have this vengeance. She goes, no, she's done toba. Mm -hmm. Right? So we can sometimes be uh, still condemned for the crime, uh, but you can still have a moral uh, sympathy for someone because you understand what the tr struggles they go through. And we do all the time, we've experienced it. But anyway, mm -hmm. he says, reduce their moral blameworthiness, but not their criminal responsibility. Among them, Palestinians have been denied their right to self-determination by Israel and have long been subject to cruel siege by Israel. The scale of Israel's actions and the great difference in both the weapon capability of the opposing side and the use of the respective weaponry. Considering those factors, it's not the same. So we know mm -hmm. moral equivalence, you should be held by a higher moral standard, mm -hmm. right? And Goldstein says, it is different, this is Gold, uh, Goldstone, sorry, I'm yes. Gold, did I say Goldstone the whole time? Yeah, you said Goldstone before. Okay, that's fine, I thought I missed it the whole time. So Goldstone, yeah. I'm saying right, right? Yeah. The Goldstone says, it is difficult to deal equally with a state party, with a sophisticated army, with an air force and a navy and the most sophisticated weapons that are not only in the arsenal of Israel, but manufactured and exported by Israel. On the other hand, with Hamas using really improvised, imprecise uh, uh, instruments, mm -hmm. arm, uh, arm, arm, armaments, mm -hmm. right? So yes, there is no moral equivalence because they don't have the ability to target the way you guys have the ability to target. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that you free them of any crime, right? The, the, the legality of it, but there's no moral equivalence between the two. Rather, you should be held to a right. far uh, higher standard uh, than that. Now, uh, just uh, one uh, other point before I let you come in, inshallah, all right, mm -hmm. is... Spare mm, one second, sorry. Can I say something? You're more than welcome. Anyway, so there's a, uh, a part here where he talks about uh, he, then he goes on to talk about protective edge, right? So he goes into the detail of that. But there's just like a, there's a, uh, some form of um, numbering here that he gives about how many people were killed, right? And so the, the figure says that uh, the amount of people that were killed by, uh, in terms of, oh, there we are, 241. Okay, right here. So on page 241, this is a protective edge. So we're talking mm -hmm. about civilian casualties, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, 
Hamas killed 73 Israelis, of whom only 8% were civilians, right? Whereas Israel killed 2,200 Gazans, of whom fully 70% were civilians. It's yes. a protective edge, yeah. right? So if you're talking about civilian casualties or targeting civilians, again, we're saying that we're not here to exonerate everything that Hamas or any Muslim does. Like we said, we're not having good words for the Muslim states here, mm -hmm. right? But the idea is of justice and fairness in your presentation of the arguments, mm -hmm. right? And again, the human shield are discussed again. You find in protective edge is no different, yeah. right? The, the denial of such. Uh, and then um, there's um, a shift where he discusses here on the human rights reports, where after pressure comes in, they start to mellow down the way they discuss- More uh, neutral Israel. terms in the way they discuss the conflict. Yeah, and, and the way they discuss Israel atrocities, they use the change in language. Mm -hmm. And so Finkelstein picks up on this and he goes for it case by case. Mm -hmm. So a case of what actually happened, right? And then, uh, uh, so what actually happened, what the human rights report said, and what should be said, yeah. and the information is provided to you. So you have like the killing of a whole family yeah. and how they say, well, maybe there wasn't, they put excuses for them. And then he goes, there should be no excuse here. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so you find this mellowing down where he says that some of the human rights organizations kind of uh, gave in to the pressure and he demonstrates lobbying as well by the whole way. But it's not, again, everything is provided with meticulous evidence. So a person can uh, refer to uh, all of that. There's also a section in here, which I, uh, again, I can't talk about everything, but it's talking about the Fotilla attack. Yeah. which was the human aid uh, from, Turkey. Uh, from Turkey that went there. And yeah. the idea of it was to uh, go into, remember, if they don't uh, control the border, as they would say, that we're outside now, mm -hmm. what are they doing on the sea anyway? And then he asked this question saying that, well, they're trying to protect that weapons don't go in. That's just a right for self-determination. Mm -hmm. So why, you can't stop that. You shouldn't be able to stop that anyway. That's my right to protect myself. Mm -hmm. I can say, why can you have weapons? Why can this country have weapons, right? But anyway, there was not weapons on this. Yeah. But the idea was that we want to go through and we don't care about your blockage, it's illegal. We're not going to recognize your blockade. Mm -hmm. So therefore we're going to go straight in. When they go in and he talks about the Israeli narrative, right? Uh, which is, uh, you know, I'll quickly quote to you this, right? Just to show the difference between people. So he says here that, um, the Israeli commanders did not fire restraint. It's the Fortilla attack. It's in 2010, mm -hmm. right? May 2010. The Israeli commanders did not fire restraint and only self-defense. On the contrary, they killed the nine passengers by shooting all but, uh, but one of them multiple times. Five were shot in the head and at least six of the nine were killed in a manner consistent with the uh, extra legal arbitrary and summary execution. Mm -hmm. That's a quotation, right? The conduct of the Israeli military and other personnel towards the, uh, the flotilla passengers was not disproportionate on the occasion, a prestigious UN fact-finding mission concluded, but demonstrated levels of total unnecessary and, un and incredible violence. It betrayed an unacceptable level of brutality. That's a description of you, the UN fact-finding fact uh, fact mission. But shortly after the release of the UN report, however, President, uh, Prime Minister, sorry, Netanyahu, praises a crucial, essential, important, and legal assault and saluted the Israeli commanders, commandos who acted courageously, morally, and with restraint against those who came to kill you and tried to kill you. They're doing what? They're here to bring aid. Mm -hmm. They're not even meant to fight you. They're supposed to go to the country. Mm -hmm. But they were trying to show a point saying there's a blockade going on. We can't go through. Mm -hmm. That was the point they're trying to show attention to. Right? And then he talks about how, you know, eventually you have these comments, but then they sell out on those comments. Allah Ta'ala knows best. Uh, there's so much more to say. I'm sure, you know, people are getting a bit, uh, whoever's gone up to this trade, Good on you guys, right? But please, I would say, uh, if uh, you know you want to do something, we can't do much. Uh, do what is in your capacity, but buy some of these books, have some reading, have some depth, uh, you know, just to learn about the the plight of any given people. And inshallah, we do plan not to restrict ourselves on these kind of issues. Any other uh, topics, whether it's the Uyghur Muslims, which is some one of our students, uh, brother Nasim, was talking to me about uh, there is a book that he sent on the Uyghur Muslims, and inshallah, you know. We can do our bit, of course, uh, with those cases, I'll prefer him or someone like coming on mm -hmm. uh, rather than me trying to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. um, but Because uh, of course, our field is something a bit different. But, you know, hopefully this kind of highlights some of these issues. So please, you know, spend some money, buy these books, spend some time, read through them meticulously and, you know, listen to those lectures uh, that, he, that, people, that people like Finkelstein talks about. There's something that Finkelstein said, and I want to end on this, inshallah, is that um, he said that and I felt very, like, it was quite emotional. I don't really get emotional much, to be honest, right? But when I heard him say this, I found this quite, you know, I don't know if he even remembers this, but it's just like a little interview from years back. And he said that, uh, they go, what do you want your legacy to be? 
right? And he said that, he goes, I had this dream once upon a time that there will come a time in a hundred years, right? That someone's going to go to the library and they will see my book and they will say, in a world that was insane, someone was speaking sanity. Because he's like, you know, this is what the facts were. And so there was at least someone speaking sense. All right. And he actually says, without boasting, he goes, I have, um, I can say that I have single hand read the most human rights reports anyone in the world today on the Israel-Palestine conflict. So he's given that much designation. But then he said this point, which I found quite sad, was that he goes, there used to be a time, this was my idea. He goes, so people used to come to me and say, Professor, I've read all your books. Mm. And then, um, so I said, oh, great, whatever, right? Then it came to a time people used to come to me, like later on as people, you know, attention span gets less. The professor, I've heard all your lectures. So thereafter, he goes, now people come to me and say, professor, I've seen all your clips. And this kind of uh, disheartens me because of all the effort that you do in writing. There doesn't seem we've got a book culture anymore. I'm adding some of this information mm -hmm. in there, right? So you don't have a book culture anymore. So now people remind me of your, of your clips, but all this effort that's been done of documenting, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as least as believers, we should take some time out. Right, the sloganeering is important. The tweets are important. Mm. The, the 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 statements like this are important. Uh, we have in the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hassan Thabit is told, mm. you know, uh, fire at them. Hassan Thabit wasn't giving an academic breakdown. It was poetry mm. that has its position. So we're not we're not. I'm not in any way saying don't do that. You know, I'm not saying don't put the WhatsApp status up. I'm saying don't do all that. That's all part of it, right? But alongside that, have some depth in what you're talking about. Take some time out. Read. It's painstaking. Right? It's, it's, it's painful, mm -hmm. but I think that's something that the, the, the little that we can do is something like this. Mm. So, you know, Allah Ta'ala make it, uh, you know, everything. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala make uh, things easy for them, uh, easy for them, and, you know, grant them success. Mm. May Allah Ta'ala allow us to, uh, you know, uh, try to fulfill our responsibility, what we can do. Um, this has been quite hard. It's again, it's the selfishness mm. comes into it, but it's not easy going through all of this. Yeah. Right? And then that's reading it. But yeah. going through it, you can't, you know, uh, it's nothing beyond that. So yeah. Allah knows best. Uh, I'll end on there if you want to make any remarks, yeah. you're more than welcome. I think uh, just adding to that, that point where um, there is a real need, especially amongst uh, the Muslim community, to um, really engage in this self education because the information that we're going to be fed um, by mainstream media uh, outlets, etc., will never be the full truth if it is the any part of the truth um and therefore we have to there find our own avenues of information and knowledge in order to make sure that when we engage in these discussions when we uh in you know engage with people on the other side uh, or just try and educate others we do so from an informed place and we don't overstep our mark and say too much which may end up causing a detriment we don't say the wrong thing, which then obviously will end up uh, damaging what we're trying to say. So um, that aspect of really going to educate ourselves is something which uh, I would concur with you in emphasizing that please do uh, pick up at least one of the books that he's written on this topic. Um, read up on the history of the conflict in the region. Make sure that, you know, these things you are looking at right now you have a context and you can you're able to put a perspective on if it. i can just add one thing so i don't want to yeah. uh, i want to stop there before but um it would be nice i don't know if someone gets this far right but if we can get um like you know a list of books that people can put for because of course people have different readings they've done yeah so if you can be like oh this book is good for this this point this book is good for this, this point and you can make a reading list as well yeah so people can i know some reading lists are overwhelming so there are reading lists out there the reason why i didn't mention it is because when you give a reading list people get overwhelmed with information so i don't know which one to go for yeah so i'll try to make it simple get this yeah that's what i said get yeah. these two books that's it start off with that you read it then go to your next book yeah Right, there's many other academics out there as well, right? This is what I found most effective for me because I like his scholarship. Mm -hmm. I like the way he speaks, etc. Right? I don't like the homework he's done. But I'm sure there's many other academics out there. So, you know, have what you want, but make it for life, making life easier for everyone. Read books, buy them, read them, and then you can go to other books you want. That's my advice. But it'd be nice to have a list and someone can make. Uh, it would be effective. It would be, be like a community list that people can make. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll say that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give victory to the people of Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, destroy the enemies of the ummah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant and forgive us for our shortcomings and our inability to act in ways that would help these people in an effective way.
Amin ya Rabbil Alameen wa salawatu wa salam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.